uh, coolest and most humble atheist on YouTube. This song is a mess. That song is a classic. I don't care if you're an atheist or not. That song is powerful. I mean, there's sweat pouring down his face. Fat Elvis's face. Uh, did I post the link? No, I didn't. So the way you call in is you just click the link. It's a bit of a litmus test, though, because if you don't figure out how to get your live, uh, live stream chat up uh, uh, in your mobile device, and if you don't know how to run Chrome, and uh, if there's any problems at all and you don't know how to fix it, uh, then maybe you shouldn't talk to me. <laughs> so am I excluding everybody over 50? I don't know. Uh, there it is, pinned. And then I need to make a disclaimer. Let's see here. Uh, warning, colon, by clicking this link and talking to me, you agree to allow me to manipulate you into doubting your theism. But feel free to manipulate me in doubting my atheism. Did that work? Let's see. Oh. Okay, I see that that call. How do I? Well, I <laughs> Speaking of being old and litmus test. <laughs> uh, Hang on, hang on. I know, I know what to do. It's very important to have a disclaimer up here because you know I don't want to be unethical. Uh, size. Whoa. There we go. And then I need to wrap it. Oh yeah, baby. I got skills. I'm smart. Uh, yeah, that's good enough, right? Okay, we got our first caller ready. Oh, life is so pleasurable. Let's hope it's a good caller. Hi, guest. Hello. Oh, Heidi. It's me. I told you Can not to I call in here. Question? I'm not good for you. Oh. You're not, I'm not good for you. No, this is a different issue. I have a question. Okay. It's Heidi. not about religion. I was wondering, I'm curious. You said that you um I've I've watched one of your uh your videos where you said you you do something and you're in the profession of where you advise banks. Yeah. Um so how do I get my brick and mortar store started if I have no credit and I have a little bit of money? Because, and then my second question for you is, have you thought about start, I think you should start a gym for the elderly only. <laughs> because you're so handsome and fit yourself, I think you should start a gym called Doug's Local Gym for the Elderly Only for the men and women of your community. Heidi, do you have a crush on me? Yes. I think I, you're totally cool. I know I, I know that's a fact, not an opinion, but you know I'm married, right? I know that. I'm just, but still, how you're not do a you get wrecker, started you? for your brick and, how do you get started for your brick and mortar store if you have no credit? Okay, if you and, have. And very, if, and very little money to start with. Well, the obvious answer is you'll need help, and you'll need help by someone who has money, and you need to convince them that your business plan is a good one and that they should invest in it, uh, and so that it can make money, and then you pay them back. Okay. What do you, what can you expect the interest to be? Uh, for a small upstart uh, business like yours, if an uh, investor can't get... 25 30 percent they're probably not going to uh help you so basically okay. so basically uh they'll probably want equity not debt meaning that 
if the business really takes off and does well, they want a percent ownership of it, which will mean that okay. they can even double their money or triple their money, which is 300%, 400%. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. So not only are we talking about theism today, I guess it's how to start a, a business and that I should start a workout company, uh, an exercise gym for old people. But then won't that gym just smell like mothballs? Like, I wouldn't want to go into a gym to work out and just a bunch of old people that smell like mothballs and borscht. Workout facility, yeah. Okay, Theus, call in. But warning, by clicking this link you're, and talking to me, you agree to allow me to manipulate you into doubting your theism. But feel free to do the same back. If you don't want the uncomfortable feeling of having your theism uh, doubted, then click off and go watch Bill Gaither sing about how Jesus is coming soon and not to worry about this life. Yeah, fitness channel incoming. I, I must admit, admit, this is a real problem with my YouTube channel. I get so many theist women who dream about me. It's really dangerous. It's very understandable, though. I, I get it. I get you. But you're going to have to let me go. Take, take that big poster of me off your ceiling and um, read the Bible, read the Quran until those thoughts are removed from your brain. Very understandable, though. <laughs> uh, there's a certain age <clears throat> uh, that you go through where you realize you're no longer really attractive to women or to the opposite sex. I haven't hit that yet. Like I said, I'm the most humble as well. Doug, why do you want to man why do you want to manipulate it, King? Hey, Jr., your mama learned you real good. Learn how to write a sentence. Get all these low IQ people, atheists in the chat. Mothballs. Sounds like you found your business name, yeah. Okay, Theus, call in. Don't be shy. Yeah, I'm sure the atheist women don't like me because I'm a conservative. Most atheist women are not conservative, except for Mel in the live stream chat. She's more conservative than I am. I think. Maybe not. I still have some compassion for the poor. I think, I think Mel wants to eat them. <laughs> uh, is she laughing? I think all theist women viewers all have a crush. No, no, no. I don't think they have a crush on me. I just think that they wish their husbands were more like me. Is there any good financial wisdom in the Bible, asked Man in Charge? Great question. Um, I think there is. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to store things in preparation for famine and so forth. So in other words, you save money for a rainy day. And I do think uh, in the Old Testament, it talks about tithing. I think that's, you know, that's okay. That you set aside a certain percentage of your income. Does it have to be 10%? No. To give to the less fortunate, the needy, like the progressive left. Sorry, Jesus. I, I can't help myself. Jesus is right next to me here. Also, debt cancellation. 
Yeah, I think that's biblical, right? But I think it's only for your own tribe, maybe? I was thinking about this this morning, actually. I think there's a lot of similarities between the Mennonite culture and the Jewish culture. About saving, debt cancellation for your fellow Mennonites, basically. But Mennonites don't do it, and I bet you Jews don't do it either. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not anti-Semitic. I love the Jews. They're one of my favorite types of people. That and bald people. If you're a Jew, please call in. If you're anti-Semitic, please call in. I would like to ask you, what is your problem with the Jews? Are you jealous that they're smarter than you? More successful than you? Well, you should be jealous. Pull yourself up by your pantyhose. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm around because I make myself laugh. If, uh, if there are theists listening um, who have called in before... Uh, you, you can call in, but I prefer to co talk to new people. I want some fresh meat. I don't like that stale old bread of theism that has have already called in. I want to taste something new, something refreshing. I wouldn't even mind if some theist is out there who really, really hates atheists to call in. Not hate, because you're commanded not to hate, but really dislikes, has a dis, distaste in your mouth over atheists. I want you to call in, and my goal would be to manipulate you in such a way that you'll love me. Pablo, because I already debunked your flyman argument. You know, Pablo, you might have, but I don't quite remember it. I don't quite remember you. But you can call in and try again, because i got no callers. I'm not loved yet. Uh, so if you want to call in and remind me how you uh, debunked the flying man. Pretty sure there is no fresh meat in the apologet apologist community. Yeah, I actually prefer to talk to... Um, to just regular Christians rather than apologists, but if you're an apologist who has at least 12 credit hours and the uh, Sean McDowell, uh, uh, what is it, Bulimia? No, what, uh, what's that university? Bohemia? No. It starts with B. What's the name of the uh, Sean McDowell's university? Biola. If you have 12 credit hours or more, <laughs> Bulimia. <laughs> Uh, call in. I'm having fun. Are you guys having fun? But uh, Pablo, call in. You know I love Mexicans. I love all people. I actually have relatives in Chihuahua, Mexico. Hey, someone just called in. I hit let in. Oh, there you are. Brooklyn. Are you there? I cannot hear you yet. Uh, so if you're, I don't even think you're talking because I don't see the thing moving. But there's a, if you can hear me, Brooklyn, there's a gearbox on the top right. Make sure your mic and your headphones are set properly. And then refresh. And then we'll see if it works. And while you try that, I will uh, answer questions in the live stream chat. Do you see similarities between BLM and anti-Semitism? Yeah. They're both racists. Uh, why do you believe Christians should be pacifists? I don't. 
but I know Mennonites do. I, I would say I'm a cultural Mennonite. Um, maybe at one time I did. I'd lean pacifistic, but I don't, like, I guarantee you if, uh, if someone was uh, raping my daughter, I would kill that person if I could. Aturo, I just talked to you yesterday. Lean pacifistic. Oh, I could hear myself say this. Am I in? You're in, barely, by the skin of your teeth. So what you really want to do is you want to bore me and my audience. <laughs> Okay, so let's do this like a street epistemology type thing. Make a claim about your religion, your theism. Okay, when you say makes the most sense, do you mean to everyone or just to you or to some people, most people? It should be for everyone. So your claim is it's that that your form of theism should be the most common sense thing for theism. Okay. And what do you ba base making sense? Like how do you, what's the metric you use whether something makes sense or not? This scenario or that scenario, right? It's your favorite uh, analogy. So basically, to me, it does not make sense that uh, I observe the reality and I can go down to the details of, uh, you know, the uh, molecules and uh, the atoms and all that. And uh, at the very end, we have these quantum fields. And then uh, from all these building blocks, you can actually arrange them in a way that would result in my intelligence consciousness that actually makes the observations. So that, uh, that to me is so far off, so such a big leap of faith, then I'd rather go with something else that I, I, I actually can relate to because uh, every night when I dream, I am creating a simulation. And uh, therefore, I can know that consciousness can create reality. Oh, okay, so what if so, I just tell you that doesn't make sense to me? Well, uh, well uh, then uh, does, does it make sense to you that some kind of quantum fields, if you uh, arrange them right, that will result in Pine Creek with its uh, memories and everything all together. Yeah. Does it make sense? Uh, and would you be able to demonstrate how and why that's necessarily the case? No. Yeah. So uh, that I don't have uh, the leap of faith in that. Uh, and I do have a, a leap of faith in things working similar to what my experience is. Uh, a reality being able to, uh, consciousness being able to create reality. Okay. So, but still doesn't make your worldview doesn't make more sense than mine, in my opinion. So what do we do? That's a, that's a good opinion, but it's not it's not based on a book. It's not based on what uh, some prophet said or whatever. It's pure. Uh, so reason. what? I mean, well, I, I can say the same to a materialistic claim. You, know, you 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 think the default default reality is materialism, but it's not. It's actually there are two defaults at the very at the very bottom of the. Uh, What's the uh, second the default? The, the second default is simulation. Okay. And your, yeah. your yeah. reason to believe that the simulation exists is because you can dream. Uh, that's a hint. It's not uh, evidence. It's not a proof, but it's a hint uh, uh, about the nature of is the evidence. Reality, yeah. Do you say you have evidence that we're in a simulation? Yeah. How can you have evidence of being in a simulation? Okay. So the answer is no. And then, so then my next question is, is your belief in the simulation falsifiable? Can you test it in any way? Uh, I can conceptually uh, visualize an experiment that would make me believe that simulation is a lot less likely. I'm yeah. listening. What is it? 
Uh, for example, if uh, if the uh, science fiction concept of you can download your memory to some kind of device and then you can interact with the device and verify ah, your memory. Gotcha. So if if, a, if AI became conscious, you would give up your belief. Not only really with AI. If, if, for example, uh, you would you would uh, look at my brain structure and you could examine my brain structure, my brain brain waves. And okay, you say uh, you analyze it with some kind of super machine or whatever in 300 years from now. And uh, you replicate that in uh, some kind of computer and you put an interface, a uh, talking interface to it. And yeah, I, I got it. Ask. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with you. That would be a good test. Um, yeah. This view, this, our worldviews in terms of uh, practicality. What, um, whether you, one takes your view or my view of naturalism. Is there any advantages practically? Uh, I would I would say there's a one big difference between the two worldviews. I believe that uh, materialism and naturalism uh, logically makes it possible for people to go the selfish way in life. Ah, so you think naturalists are more likely to be selfish than your pantheism stuff? Uh, it would it would be logical for them to do uh, to be be so. Yeah. Why, is, I mean, after, why would it be logical life, to be more well first of all one line. first of all i got to ask why is selfishness bad under your worldview uh okay so that's a, that's a little bit uh, uh philosophical uh conclusion but uh, uh basically we have uh several factors uh in in our uh existence uh and uh, i i think the one factor uh, the one pole that is uh, valid for each and every human situation uh, is decisions whether they are made uh, aligned with love or with selfishness. And that uh, everybody can do it, no matter what situation, no matter how rich you are, uh, where you are in history. What's the difference which, uh, between a motive of love and a motive of selfishness? Um, uh, love is not a motive, it's a guiding force. Oh, okay. It's not really a motive. Okay, what's the difference between the guiding force of love versus the guiding force of selfishness? Well, who is in the center, whether you regard the other ones uh, uh, more than yourself. Uh, okay, it's, it's why is it better to value others before yourself? Uh, it, uh, well, that's, that's a basic value. Uh, you can state whether to you selfishness is a better value or not. So it's just opinion? It's an opinion and it's also, also a society might be working uh, better uh, if uh, everybody would be lo loving and respecting each other. That would be, a, I think, a good thing. See, I would, I would posit to you that you can't truly value other people until you value yourself first. Is that selfish? What do you mean uh, value yourself? I mean, you take care of your own comfort and everything first? Well, no, that you can actually have some type of, um, in order to empathize with others, I think you have to first empathize with yourself, know your limitations, know, know your weaknesses, know your strengths, know why yeah. certain things hurt so you can empathize with others so you don't hurt them. Yeah, that's uh, that to a degree, that's true, yeah. So, but is but that the, selfish the, the, to start with yourself first? I think the harmful selfishness comes in, uh, in play when uh, you make decisions uh, uh, to enrich yourself at the expense of others uh, where, where this is actually causing harm. And it, to me, there's a fine line between selfishness and self-interest. Yes, there is. Yeah, that's why it's, a, it's, a, a, I mean, it's a, these are great, great questions, but, uh, and everybody is uh, a, a blessed with a mind to decide in their lives. But yeah. ultimately, I think. So what I'm hearing, I there's no advantage to your worldview than mine, because uh, I actually don't view self-interest slash selfishness as definitely always bad. And it can actually be very good. Like I, um, I'm selfish over my own kids. I, I would prefer, I would protect them, um, provide for them way sooner, way, way sooner than any other kid on the planet. Is that selfish? Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, uh, if you go to a degree where, you know, this is going to be obviously harmful to, uh, like a group of other kids, for example, no matter what, you're going to be even uh, cheating or, 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 uh, doing all kinds of uh, tricks uh, so that your kids uh, have it better, whereas uh, they could have it a mo lot, lot more fair. See, I, th I, think, I, think, I think my worldview explains this better, and I think I speak for most parents. Well, yeah, I'd say most parents. If I, I'm in a rowboat boat as a parent, and I have a choice of either throwing my child 
overboard and let them drown, or three other people's kids. I'm I'm drowning three other kids. <laughs> but here's another here's another uh, I guess uh, point. Uh, not only that uh, uh, you can compare which one is better, uh, loving or being selfish, but uh, once uh, once uh, you're thinking in terms of uh, being in a simulation, then naturally it's more likely that the simulation has its creator than not. And if so, then uh, it's more likely that this creator will had a purpose uh, of putting you into the simulation. But this is all fluff talk to me. Like, uh, do you fluff want? Talk, yeah. yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm barely even listening to you. This is how fluffy it is. Um, do you want me to share your worldview? Do you want me um, to be like you? I think it would be good for um, most of society, yes, to be uh, uh, conscious. But let's of start this, with uh, let's start with me. Why do you want me to be like you and share this worldview? Uh, I think if you're uh, a loving person, then you're fulfilling the purpose for which you are here. Uh, yeah, this sounds just like the Christians. Yeah, that's that's the that's the alignment with Christianity. Okay, so you want me to embrace your worldview because then I would be serving my purpose. Then that it would be good for you. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good for me. You know, you say those words, you, and there's absolutely you, you nothing. Salvation. Arturo, what's so, salvation for? What in your worldview? What what am I being saved from? Uh, well, salvation is the judgment and the. The, the the result of the judgment of your life on your life that's salvation whether you pass or you fail okay the natural <laughs> consequence of being evaluated I, I mean there's words coming out of your mouth but i'm finding very little meaning or something to cling on to it's like people pe that. people do things that are either good choices or bad choices they make mistakes they do they don't make mistakes these okay. choices lead to certain results that happens whether you're a naturalist or your worldview right okay so i think the purpose of you and me being here is we need to prove our alignment with love versus selfishness why do we so need we to earn... because that's why we were put here so that's the purpose only again. unknown factor that's the only unknown factor for the creator in this whole setup okay I don't believe that creator exists. Now what? Well, then obviously you will lean not to uh, uh, regard this uh, uh, thing in your life. Yeah, and what have I lost? In my view, in my view, you're risking uh, going selfish and you're risking failing your salvation. Ah, okay. So, do, in your opinion, you would say naturalists are more selfish than people who have your view they can they tend they can tend to be more selfish because logically uh, their worldview allows right. it okay and then we already talked about this yeah i don't necessarily yeah. see that as always bad and um and i don't even yeah, agree just, with you. Yeah, i think i think a, there's a lot of benevolent atheists out there who do good things that's, uh, that's a fact, of course yeah. yes but if you think about all this uh, megalomania, suicide, everything, you cannot commit suicide or you cannot be a, a megalomaniac, a, a crazy person and do all kinds of atrocities if you really believe you're going to go on and you're going to face something. I mean, they, they were just foolish. Hitler did it. Uh, yeah, because he, did, he didn't believe there's anything uh, coming after life, of course. Are you sure about Stalin that? in the same way. I'm sure about that. Because... Uh, Hitler wasn't an atheist. They, they, might, they, might belong, uh, they might seemingly belong to some kind of religion or whatever, but deep down, they don't believe that. They believe with death, that's it. That's why they are they feeling free to commit all the atrocities that... Can uh, someone fact can... check Arturo here? Is that true that Hitler didn't believe in an afterlife? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's the case, but how would you verify that? With who? Well, if in his writings, he might have talked about it. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think you're right about Stalin, though. I think he was an avowed atheist. For sure, uh, I would bet. Uh, even if there, if there, there would be a, some uh, early saying where he claims to be, yeah, maybe there's something. Uh, for sure, by the end, when he started uh, doing his atrocities, he didn't believe that. But you yourself admitted that you can be a naturalist and do great things and not be like Hitler or Stalin, right? And and I also believe I also believe that belief is not the necessary thing for salvation. 
So atheists can also achieve salvation even if they don't wish to. Okay, Arturo, thanks for calling in. I see no need for your worldview. I don't have any uh, desire for your worldview. I don't believe your worldview. But thank you for calling in. Sure. Okay. Ouch. <laughs> Nick. Hello. Hi, welcome here. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing well. On a scale of 1 to 10, what's your number? Uh, your sleep number. <laughs> Um, man. I'm a nine today. The lower today. I get, the lower it gets. Um, oh, really? Yeah. The older yeah, I get, the I higher it gets. I started sleeping on like an incline about a year ago. I don't know why. Oh, you, you don't have that? No, no. I sleep like a baby. Oh, what's your secret? Uh, what's my secret? Um, don't, I mean... What's my secret to sleeping like a baby? I, I, be happy? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry? Uh, exercise? Eat well? Which I don't always do. And uh, what else? Yeah, don't try not to go to bed angry. Yeah, I don't know. I just Maybe it's genetic too. Maybe I just was pre-programmed to sleep well. That's a good one, actually. Don't I don't go to bed angry, but I do go to bed. I try to shortly after I watch like YouTube videos like this, and they always get me thinking, and that probably keeps me up. Oh, you're like a woman. Should women have a lot of women have that problem? Maybe you're trans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not, but. Uh, because yeah, I guess I don't know my wife, my daughter, and a lot of other women I know in my life, they're like you. They they something intriguing or whatever, and they just can't stop thinking about it. They can't turn off the brain. That's the beauty about being a real man. You can just turn your brain off. I mean, yeah. You know, sometimes we're stupid because we turn our brain off, but at least we sleep well. Anyhow, Nick, what did you want to talk about? Well, I saw your. Um, I'm a Christian. And I saw your prompt that we could call in and um, you would manipulate us. <laughs> you like that, right? Atheism. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm, I'm here to learn. See, Myron, the bait worked. Myron is my assistant. He thought it wouldn't work. No, he called in because I said I would manipulate his brain. Yeah, I should fire him. So have at it. I'm ready. Okay, uh, so I have your permission to, to try to cause you to doubt your theism. I need a verbal yes in order to uh, proceed. Sh uh, sure. That's what my yes. lawyers have told me from the Wichita Home Office. Okay, Got Okay. It. Uh, and and <laughs> you can you uh, can get me to doubt my atheism atheism too. But um, what type of okay. theist, theist are you? You said Christian? Yeah. Okay, and what type of Christian are you? I know that sounds like a weird question, but, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox... Well, I was raised going to a Methodist church. Um, I, I would say I didn't become a Christian, though, until I started attending a Presbyterian church. Oh, I like uh, the Presbyterian years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, I went to a Presbyterian church as well. I like them because I felt very safe and secure there because they're Calvinists. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yes. Uh, Okay. So probably in the Reformed tradition, I, I don't know that I could speak to every single issue that would can fall under the umbrella of Reformed, but in general, I guess I agree with that. Have you ever watched my channel before? I have, yeah. I've seen a couple of your videos. I okay. just watched um, your debate review of James White and Leighton Flowers, I think it was. Okay, so you understand that I, I understand Calvinism and kind of like it and... Um... Let me ask you this before sure. we, I ask you any other question, because it might be, I, I'm a very efficient guy. I don't like wasting time, although okay. I have four-hour live streams. Uh, <laughs> is there any chance in your mind that Christianity could be false? At this, at this point, I would say no. No. Okay, if so now... If you would ask me that... 20 years ago i would probably be a little more on board with that as a possibility but increasingly i would say no okay 
see that saddens me a little okay. because um for many reasons but let me like please don't take offense to this but i'm going to make a claim right now i'm going to claim you don't value truth i'm not offended okay now do you know why i say that i don't okay so let's say someone believes something and i ask them we're not talking about religion we're talking about something else and I ask them, is there any chance you're wrong about X? X can be anything that they truly believe. And they say, no, it's not possible. I can be wrong. And we're not talking about 2 plus 2 equals 4. We're talking about some type of worldview or whatever, political view. Um, and they say, no, it's not possible. I'm wrong. I would say they don't value truth because in order to value truth, you have to be open to the idea that you may be wrong. And... And that what you currently think is true might not be. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay. So does it bother you that you say there's no chance Christianity is false, and yet you agree with what I said about valuing truth, you have to be open to the idea that you may be wrong if you truly value truth? Well, I would say I, I do understand your point, I think. Um, I would say that's why I use the word like increasingly I'm increasingly confident that this is true I guess um, so are you saying there is a chance that Christianity could be false then well I think um, just uh, how, let me think how I would say this I think you always want to be open to the possibility that until like until I'm face to face with God and I have like verification, so to speak, that I'm in the immediate presence of the divine. Um, you know, I, it's just, I, I'm like seeing it as like a 0.0001% chance that I'm gotcha. hallucinating all this or something. It's just, I don't. Um, so you're saying you're like 99.999% confident. Yeah, it's all of the counter arguments and things I've been presented with and, and just in terms of explaining my experience um, seem to fall short. The best explanation, I think, just for me personally, is that um, Christianity is the, the truth. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to see where else this conversation goes, but I mean... Um, Okay, so your reasoning, so far what I'm hearing, I'm re repeating back what you're saying to show you that I'm listening to you. What sure. you're saying is that you're very, very confident, and um, part of the reason you're very, very confident is because of these many experiences you've had. <coughs> yeah, and my understanding of the Bible and um, my understanding of, you know, the alternative explanations for the, like things like the Gospels or the New Testament, um, they don't seem to hold as much water as the simplest explanation, which is just that Christ was who um, the New Testament claims he was and that the Gospels are a form okay. of ancient journalism, that sort of thing. I think the counters I've heard to that, for me, don't really um, hold as much water. Okay. So. Can you name for me a false religion? that you think is false? Just off the top of your head. False, like capital F or false that can be yeah, like, like falsities I'm, in it. Every religion says some things that are true, right? But I'm talking about the core propositions which makes a religion religion. Can you just off the top of your head name a false religion? Um, I would think like Scientology or um, trying to... I mean, we can take Scientology if you want. Okay. So let's say you and I are talking to a Scientologist and they say that the writings of Hubbard um, make sense to them, resonate with them, and any alternative explanation that you and I could give them, they haven't found convincing. Why do you think they would say those things? Um, I would say they're either genuinely convinced that that's the case, mm -hmm. or there's something uh, about it that they need to be true. 
Right. So it's either prompted by like a genuine, genuine, like they're convinced by it or, um, you know, insecurity, comfort, that sort of thing. Uh, there's something about it that, that fulfills a need. And so they're kind of protecting um, it being exposed that it's not true, which is a common, I think, accusation that's leveled by atheists against all theists, regardless of their... But would you say that those, those are good alternate explanations for that Scientologist who says, you know, people criticize uh, Ron Hubbard's uh, <coughs> writings, but every explanation I've been given uh, just doesn't seem uh, to jive. And you're saying, well, they might say something like that because they're very, very convinced they might be insecure about what if this is wrong. They get comfort from Scientology. They feel fulfilled in Scientology. They might have a community sure. in Scientology. Would you yeah. say that 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 bias against Scientology that they're pushing back against for all these reasons could apply to you? Um, I would need to ask some further questions. I didn't become a Christian because it was necessarily comfortable. I mean, in almost every way, my life has become more uncomfortable as, it, as I've become a Christian. Um, so I don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't equate myself to that, but I do understand your, um, I think I understand your point. Like I'm talking about bias, right? Like we all have biases. Atheists um, are not immune to it. Sure. Um, I've talked to many people of different religions in the past, and I've heard Muslims, I haven't talked to too many Scientologists, in fact, I don't think any, but I've heard many Muslims say something very similar to you that, hey, I've read the Quran, I've read the, uh, the Hadiths, and these, ex these, these complaints, these critiques that Christians say, that atheists say, I have not found them convincing at all. And then I... You and I can ask, well, why is it that they don't find it convincing? It's probably because they're deep into the religion, right? They got so much at stake. They got sunk costs. They've been in it for many years, let's say. Their whole family are Muslim. And so sure. what got me out of Christianity was being willing to risk losing all that. To risk even going to hell. Because I just wanted to figure out what is true or not. And then I started asking the what's more likely type questions. What's more likely? That the Gospels actually reflect what this man actually said and did, and this man did things like walk on water, raise the dead. What's more likely that actually happened? Or this book just says so, and these are stories, and maybe even flat out lies. Like, aren't those explanations more likely than a man actually walking on water, actually raising the dead? Um, I honestly, I guess I, that might be a point of departure for us. I think I would probably, um, when I read the gospels, um, I, it's not, I mean, it's not at all written like fiction. I mean, it's just, you know, you can make, like, we have types of fiction today that, um, are, are designed to reflect what nonfiction looks like. So, so an example, I guess, would be um, like when you see a horror movie that's like a found footage film where everything in it is actually structured. It's fictitious, but it's structured to look real. But that's very, I think an important question to ask is, is what does real journalism today look like? And then what does <coughs> fiction that's designed to look like journalism look like and you compare them and you see where they're different and i i mean my understanding when i read the gospels i don't i'm not reading something that's either fictitious or feels like it's fictitious okay. but designed to be like journalism it, I, it does I understand read. your I point nick i understand oh, your sure. point you're, you're you're saying that when you read the gospels and maybe other books in the new testament um it just doesn't seem like this is a fictional story but let me. Oh, I would make one more point, but go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to Well, I was going to ask you this. Could it be that some of the things in the Gospels reflect true history and some things not? How would you verify that? 
Well, um, some things might be very difficult. But but first, can you answer that question? Like, one is verification, but one is about just possibility. So what or plausibility? Is it reasonable to say that some things in the New Testament that are reported as history actually is history? And is it reasonable to say that something reported as history is not history? Is that reasonable to say? I, as a general statement, I don't see a problem with that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that would apply to, I guess, anything. Right. Because, you know, I think we're both agreed humans wrote the New Testament. And so yeah. uh, some of it might be true and some of it might be false. That's re trying to report it as true, but it's still false. Like even historians say this about Josephus and Tacitus and other people, that they didn't get everything right. In fact, maybe they even lied sometimes. Um, so, but I loved what you said about it doesn't read as fiction. If we were to take any other book other than the Bible and it described someone being raised from the dead, is your automatic intuition that this is history or is or is it that okay it could be true but i really doubt it I, my automatic intuition to the bible was that i doubt it now, i'm talking yeah. about a different so, book other than the bible yeah for any for any book if if i'm strictly going on just the claim itself um i would doubt it right yeah I, yeah of course okay but for the bible if it makes a claim of someone rising from the dead you believe it well, I mean, after years, yeah, of asking that question, like, why should I believe this? Why should why should I believe that this is accurate versus just made up? Um, and what did you figure out? I mean, that's you know, how much time do we have? <laughs> well, can we can we bullet point? I'll, it? I'll condense it. I can I can recommend a few resources if you're interested. Well, well, well Nick, Nick, oh, go ahead. Um. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm just going to come out and say this. There's probably yeah. nothing you can say I haven't heard a thousand times before. Okay. So, so like, I'm familiar. I'm trying to, you're not evangelical. So, well, you're Presbyterian, you said. But, but you could be, you know, thinking about people like Lee Strobel. Uh, no, yeah. I no. Richard Bauckham. Have you ever heard oh, of yeah. Richard Oh, yeah. Yeah. Richard Bauckham. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. the, he's the names guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if you like Richard Bauckham, you might even like N.T. Wright, maybe? No? I I know the name. I haven't read his stuff, but I understand the gist of his basic argument. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But if you like Bauckham, there's a few other apologists slash historians. Habermas? I don't know Habermas. Okay. No. Okay. Um, I, I tend to look at, like, um, like, I try to look into textual criticism a little mm -hmm. bit. I'm not at all an expert on this, but um, I do listen to guys like Bart Ehrman, even though I know he's not a Christian. I do the best I can with research on like the Institute of New Testament textual, um, I think it's just textual research out of Munster, Germany. Um, and so it's, you know, there are, um, and another name, I guess you might know, I just got his book, I haven't read it though, is Josh McDowell. I think he's kind of an older name. Yeah. Um, Sean McDowell knows me, his son. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I asked him to come on the show, and you know what he said? He said what did he say? He said, I'll pray about it. What a <laughs> cop-out, right? <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, I don't know, I guess it's not for for everybody, the, the call-in format. Um but, uh, but let me yeah, let, let, let me um, sure let me try it wherever you want to take it. Yeah, yeah, let me try to bullet point form it for you, and then okay. you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay, so uh, the question was, what is the reasons you think that this is is reliable? That this is history? Um, you might say something like eyewitness accounts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You sure. might you might say um, prophecy from the Old Testament. Yeah, um, I, you could go there. I that wouldn't be an argument that I would make. But okay, yeah, fair I enough. Guess you could. Fair sure. enough. You might talk about martyrdom. Honestly, I would talk mostly about the person of Christ Himself. Uh, that would be the the argument that I would make. That 
he's he's not somebody you would want to make up which is Ah. that that's that's really my view is that when you look at his standards for perfection one of the things you realize is that um he condemns even the people that made him up you know his his basically his standard for getting into heaven so to speak is so high that even the people who invented him wouldn't make it so it's kind of like i'm being asked to believe that either a small group of people or a large group of people over time say either invented out of whole cloth or maybe based it on a historical person but the the primary issue is um in my mind he says things that nobody would want to be true and that's part of the okay giveaway, well hang on a second I this think. is this is yeah. interesting uh nick you yeah. said jesus is a person that people wouldn't make up okay what if i told wouldn't you wouldn't want to wouldn't yeah. want to make up what if i told you nick i'm willing to die for you i'm willing to take a bullet for you i mean if you are ever in trouble i'll do whatever it takes to save you okay. i'm being and let's say okay i'm making this up but let's say i say this to you and in a way that to convince you that's true what goes through your internal being isn't this like if you're convinced i'm being honest with you you like me right i mean we've only known each other for a couple of minutes but yeah i'd be flattered and yeah, but obviously let's... i'd be uh, yeah yeah i'd be um, i'd be touched i'd be very touched no, but let's say I said this for other intent uh, intentions to maybe get you to follow me and do the things I say. But you're convinced I'm serious. I care about you so much, Nick. Like every second of your day, I'm thinking about you. And the struggles you go through, the good times you go through. And I want only the best for you, Nick. In fact, someday my plan is for you to live with me and in this very amazing place. See, this this is, as an atheist, this is how I view the person of Jesus in the New Testament. The, okay. the, the Jews were persecuted from the Romans, right? Here in the, in the Old Testament, the Jews were called the chosen people and the egyptians enslaved them uh they i mean just so many bad things happened to them and he yet god says you're the chosen people sure there was good times and god blessed them but there's many bad times but then the romans came along and it's like things are not getting any better what's going on and then the new testament was written that totally flipped the script to help explain why these chosen people are having it so rough because the kingdom is not on this earth. The kingdom is in heaven, and it's coming soon. And you don't have to fight against the Romans. You can. Jesus was an example of sacrifice, non-resistant um, uh, type of pushing against. That's how some Christians interpret it. But the main point I'm getting at is that I personally can totally understand why people would make up um, this idea of Jesus. And I don't even think it was made up. I think Jesus himself believed this. And I, but I think this was a teaching from the Essene movement. There was like three main, <clears throat> three main branches of Christianity, the Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. And Jesus probably came out of the Essene movement. We don't, I can't prove this to you, but... Uh, and I think that these Jews, which were by far the minority, b- believed this, that they were trying to make sense of the world they lived in, and jesus got a following he started teaching these things but i think he was just a man and he ended up dying and then they had the people who followed him had tremendous cognitive dissonance of what our leader our our savior has died totally forgetting that apparently jesus told him he would rise again and so maybe one maybe two people had what's called a um what do you call it death vision which happens in 16 percent roughly in people even today seeing loved ones hearing loved ones multi-tactile type visions and i'm saying not group 
not group, one, maybe two people, and then it started spreading like wildfire. I saw Jesus. And all that specific stuff, like Jesus saying to Thomas, touch my holes and all that, made up. At a time, like in the late century, first century, in the late first century, I think it's very reasonable to say this was made up as an apologetic to get people to believe in this for a greater good. Now, and that what greater what good was. the greater good was that you don't have to fight against the Romans. Our um, reward is in heaven. Our kingdom is in heaven. That this explains why we're being persecuted. And, and it, you can be okay with that. And your expectation of this, um, that everything should be going the Jews' way now, was a false expectation. The book of Revelation then came later, but you know Christians differ on what that means. But, but everything I'm saying, I view as reasonable. Especially... I mean, if you can imagine we're talking about a different religion, and I'm explaining like Islam, like Muhammad or whatever, I think you would right away say, yeah, Doug, that sounds reasonable. Muhammad was probably had a beef with Christians and, and wanted things changed. But, you know, did he really go into a cave and hear from God through Gabriel? No, probably not. And then a bunch of people uh, said he did. Uh, compiled the uh, Quran within 40 years, and then the Hadiths came later. Like I think you and I would be agreed that this is very, very reasonable explanation for Islam. And I'm saying what I just said is very reasonable explanation for Christianity. Well, I <clears throat> so I would want to try to restate what I just heard you say to make sure I'm understanding it. Yeah, great. Is it? it are you saying it's your view that? Um, Essentially, the Gospels grew out of meeting a specific need, and that need was Jewish sects that were experiencing Roman persecution and needed something to hope in, specifically the notion that... Um, um, how did, I want to I want to try to put it the way you put it. So if I got this wrong, just jump in and correct me. But um, that you know, when Christ says, "My kingdom is not of this world," um, to Pilate, and um, the idea of the kingdom of heaven, their kingdom being in heaven, mm -hmm. it's not part of this world. They don't need to worry about this world because they will uh, sort of inherit the reward. Yeah, eventually to come. Heaven. Yep. Okay. It is that. Um, did I get that right, or was there anything? Yeah, I, and I'm not giving like that's the the sort of the foundation of why not just atheists, why a lot of non Christians uh, how they view the New Testament. Okay, that's actually very uh, helpful, honestly, to to hear and understand that. The question I would ask is, um, so I would kind of flip it right around and say like um it's one thing to look at christianity as a worldview and from a posture of skepticism um begin to ask questions of it like it's internal logic it's external logic i think it's also helpful to look at the worldview you kind of just expressed from a posture of skepticism as well and say okay does this line up with the data we have one of the challenges I would have in adopting that understanding is what Christ says at the end of Matthew, when he says, um, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go disciple the nations. So he, his commandment is actually something for this world. And I think the fact, when you look at the New Testament, the fact that you've got a letter to a church in Rome, a letter to a church in Ephesus, mm -hmm. a letter to a church in Colossae, Thessalonica. Like, you've got, Paul is writing letters specifically to churches, meaning people are going out. They're not, they're not saying, like, take no mind for the tomorrow, like, everything's coming, you can just wait for heaven. They're actually saying, hey, this guy really came back to life, and his mission is... To make all things new 
in, in heaven and on earth, right? So, so I, that's one of the problems I might have with adopting that interpretation of the data is that the data itself okay, let me... would suggest the opposite. Just in, just in terms of like a reason for why it would be made up, if that were the case, I would not expect to find direct commandments and evidence of people saying, we need to go out into the world and make converts. Does that make sense? If what they're waiting for a little, is just in heaven, but but like I, th you know, Islam wants to proselytize. Uh, Mormons proselytize. Like if you're, I'm not quite sure if I sure. understand you about. You're you're saying the fact that people went to make disciples within Christianity that makes it more likely it's true. Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is, and and. It, would, I don't want to end up making a point that doesn't address what you're saying. I, I'm responding to what it is I understand your point to be. And my understanding of your point is that Christianity arose out of a need. That need was Roman persecution of Jewish sects. They're being persecuted here in this world. And so we invent Christianity to say, don't worry about this world. Almost, almost it it's, resembles almost Gnosticism in a way that you don't need to worry about the material because you have the immaterial to look forward to. Right. What I'm saying is the, pro the problem with that is that the very data you're appealing to suggests the exact opposite. That well, no, the, the I, I, I actually, I think I understand what you're saying now. You're saying, but they are worried yeah. about this world because they're, they're evangelizing. But what well, are they? Not, it's not that they're worried about this world. It's that this world matters. Right, it's, right. It's specifically, yeah. Well, <laughs> God, God created this world because he loves his creation. And so we're not going to don't but surrender it to Paul said himself that this world is just a vapor. Right. And if he could die, he would. But he has work to do. So Paul's view of the world was sure. that I rather not be here, but God has a plan and I got to fulfill it. So his will be done. So this was Paul's view. And Paul uh, I just want to get your take on it. Are you under the impression yeah. Paul saw Jesus? Uh, you're talking about the road to Damascus experience? Like, does Paul claim to have seen Jesus like the disciples did? My understanding is he didn't see him at the same time as the disciples, and I would have to check the New Testament text, but I, I do believe he... Um, I'm trying to remember in this moment exactly how the road to Damascus story goes, as well as I think there's a portion where he talks about being taught by the Lord. Right. I, it's, I don't remember if it's mentioned there that he like directly saw the Lord. So yeah. I, ca I can't answer the question because I don't know. See, like, a, like an atheist like me would say things like, well, Paul never saw Jesus bodily as far as we know. And the Damascus okay. road, the, the Damascus road experience Paul didn't even talk about that's found in the book of Acts what Paul does say is what you said that everything he learned came from through revelation through the scriptures and that Jesus appeared to him in first Corinthians 15 and but in what sense did Jesus appear to him because remember Jesus apparently died rose again spent about 40 days on on earth and then ascended into heaven all prior to Paul writing and talking about his scriptures. Because remember, mm -hmm. Paul was persecuting, according to Acts, uh, persecuting the Christians. Well, no, even according to him, he says that too. So you brought up Romans, you brought up, uh, I think, Ephesus, Ephesians. These are books yeah. that Paul wrote, which are the earliest, uh, one, some of the earliest books in the New Testament, from a man who never even really walked and talked with Jesus. Well, I mean, that's, but that would be precisely the point that's under debate. I, I would say it's the thing, I hear what you're saying, and I would agree with you in the sense that um, when Jesus was personally present here on earth, it's not my understanding that he walked and talked with Paul specifically at that time. He did or didn't? He, that he did not. Right. Um, but this is one of the things that I think, um, you know, you, I saw in your prompt that you were offering Christians to try to manipulate you as well. So let me take advantage of that here if I see a little opening. One of the things I would do maybe is ask this question. Um, hypothetically, if 
the Gospels are a form of journalism. And if they're documenting the, um, the events of, of a historical person, one question to ask is, how, should I, how do I come at this? If Jesus really is who he says he is, then there's going to be a continuity in the way other people describe him based on their interactions with him. I mean, you, I, you know, if you go to like a wedding or a party where you don't know everybody, but everybody's there just because they're all there because of the same friend, right? Like they're, they're all at the wedding because they're there because it's their childhood friend or their college friend. They all know this person from some walk of life. They can all share stories about their encounters with this person. And there's a continuity to the way that that person's described between multiple people because they're all encountering a real person. So one of the things I would say is when you read the Gospels and then you read the letters of Paul, if you start with the hypothesis that Christ is a real person, then you can ask the question, what kind of continuity would I expect to see in the person of Christ as described between all okay. these different sources? Yeah, let me address this. And what, and what difference based on the personality of the individual authors. So there needs to be a blend, but okay, so that, I, that would be my... Yeah, so it's a continuity question and how do I deal with that? I don't view it as um, consistent. So even okay. definitely not between the New Testament and Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, Noah's family was saved by their righteousness, by Noah's righteousness. In the New Testament, people are saved by their un because of their unrighteousness. In the Old Testament, the Jews, Noah's family, were saved. They were blessed because of their obedience and righteousness. And in the New Testament, it's because you are unrighteous and no good in you, you need to be saved by grace. And that leads me to the New Testament. In Paul's, in the earliest letters in the New Testament, salvation was through grace, lest ye boast, not by works, by faith, by mm -hmm. grace. In, but Jesus never utters the words of Paul of that you're saved by grace. When you talk to, um, when Jesus talks reportedly to his followers, he always talks about actions and belief, not about uh, grace. In fact, Jesus never utters the word grace in the Gospels. But Paul talks about it a lot. So I don't view it as continuous consistent. And is Jesus that well, like, yeah. what? And even the nature of Jesus. What is Jesus like? Is Jesus a person who is, um, who wants to drown children, or as it talks about in the Old Testament with the flood, or is he the type of person, type of God who says, "Let the children come to me." To me, that's. Yeah, I was wondering when we were going to go there, just because I've seen some of your videos where you yeah. talk about the flood, and I was like, "Oh, here we go." I'm calling in. I'm like, "God, please." And I think I think the difference between <laughs> but you I've and, really enjoyed this conversation, so I'm enjoying it so far. But yeah, and the re and the reason why I think you and I might disagree on this is that because of uh, and I'm guessing here, but because of your personal experiences and maybe other things, the textual criticism part, um, and the things you were describing before, the the need, uh, maybe p uh, hope, meaning, and purpose, that sort of thing, you will see this as continuous continuity, consistent. And I won't because I haven't had the experiences you've had. I haven't. I, I probably know the textual criticism better than you, maybe. But um, yeah, I, I just there is nothing in me that says, "Oh, this." It's impossible for this to be a story. Like, of course, it, the consistency of the New Testament. I, I do agree there is a lot of consistency in the New Testament. However, I don't think these are independent accounts. Paul apparently had a traveling uh, um, companion named Luke. Uh, Mark uh, was a secretary of Peter. Um, Peter knew Matthew. Matthew knew John. John knew Matthew. Uh, it, it's an incest. If you believe in the traditional authorship of the Gospels, it's a bunch of friends getting together and writing a book, several books, which is not what you would view as respected journalism if you want to get to uh the evidence and whether something's true you don't you don't get a bunch of people together and collude and talk to each other and be buddy buddy and drink beers together and say okay uh what did you write here yeah i'm going to write something similar although i disagree with you a little bit here so i'm going to change it a bit and this is what you see with matthew boring for mark luke boring for matthew and and mark 
John's a little different. Um, but well, it the, makes sense to me. I, sorry, I'm cutting you off. No, no, I'm really I, enjoying I talked the conversation, but I don't want to cut you off. Please keep going the way you're talking. Yeah, and so I I view this. So if I had a time machine, and I could bring you in it, in it, this is what I think happened. I okay. think there was a small group of Jews back in the first century who had these beliefs uh, similar to the scene movement, pacifism, sacrifice, that sort of thing. The leader Jesus had a following, dies, probably thrown in a pit, never died on a cross, uh, died on a cross maybe, but thrown in a pit, never put into a tomb. That came later. Paul never talks about a tomb, for example. We have a, a report of a, a vision of a guy named Paul who was persecuting these Christians. So maybe he had guilt. Maybe he had... Uh, he, I think references his kinmen uh, became Christians. Uh, maybe that's why he became a Christian as well, not only guilt, but because he had friends that were Christian and he felt guilty about it. Uh, this guilt led to this type of vision that he had or appearance. He's, because he started talking to other Christians and even the reported disciples, a lot of things jived. <coughs> he started writing uh, books um, in uh, maybe Rome or in uh, Antioch and Corinth, whatever. And, I mean, this is 15 years after the fact, and he even admits that this is at a time when people are starting to die off. Now, imagine um, telling the, the Corinthians about Jesus uh, raising from the dead, and then and, the, and some doubting Corinthians say, I'm not sure if this is true. Let me take a month of my life off, make the 1,000-kilometer journey from Antioch all the way to Jerusalem by camel, by boat, or however, but I'm poor, so I'm going to have to take a big chunk of my life savings, and then i got to get to Jerusalem and try to find people who could falsify this and say, no, this Jesus didn't raise from the dead, this didn't happen, the, the miracles didn't happen. I mean, there would be, it'd be so difficult, even in 55 AD, to falsify this stuff from people writing to people in Corinth or Ephesus or Rome. So it. Well, and when you add in the difficulty of just, I mean, it's not like today where we can go to Staples and get printing paper and create something. Just the sheer difficulty of getting a manuscript itself off the ground. Yeah, I think I, I read this somewhere. I can, I'm trying to remember where, but they said the average manuscript for um, a small community in ancient Israel would have would have taken two years worth of wages of like an entire community just to create one manuscript because not everybody knows how to write. Not everybody knows how to make the paper, you know, make the ink like it's. And I think that's part of like part of the challenge here is part of the challenge with um, any ancient history is looking at it and going, okay, I'm sure, you know, maybe 500, 1,000 years from now, people will be able to make their own rockets, say, and go to space. I'm just saying hypothetically. Um, and if they look back on history and go, well, it's always been this easy, they won't understand how difficult and how amazing it is what Elon Musk has done, say, with SpaceX because of how difficult it is to make a rocket to go to space in 2024. I think there's a sense in which not appreciating how difficult it is to make one manuscript of anything, like how you had to be positioned, basically. So you don't have um, unlimited options like you do today where anybody anywhere can just make so What's the main up. point it's of what you're saying here? Well, the main point of what I'm saying is that um, in the ancient world, when you, when you look at the fact that anything was written down, you have to ask the question, why? Why would they go to the trouble to write this down, given the cost involved? Okay, why, why, is it why, really why did the Muslims, the very first Muslims, go through the trouble to write the Quran? Oh, they were probably convinced that it was true. Right, even and though it's, it's false, right. right? Well, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with the Quran. I mean, yeah. I haven't... I, in, Full disclosure, so that could be the same answer cover. for Christians. Like right? you answer, you ask the question: Why did they go through the trouble? Like it's so expensive. Why would they write all this stuff down? Because they were convinced. Is, it, some right. of them, at least, were convinced it was true, just like the Muslims. And but that, that doesn't mean my, it's true. That goes to my earlier point, which is my understanding right now is that the Quran has one author, which is Muhammad. Um, when yeah. I the the Old Testament and the New Testament. Does Forty different author, authors over three continents over 2,000 years, right? Right. And yeah. like you said earlier, I would see 
um, a, I do see a continuity there in the scriptures. For example, when you talk about like right, and Muslims see a continuity in the Quran and the Hadiths. Okay, I, and sure, and I and this is why I would say it's perfectly fair to ask the question. I think there are two different questions. I think it's what causes someone to act, right? If they're convinced that something is true, it doesn't mean it's true, but it just means it that explains why we have it because they're convinced yeah. that something incredibly significant happened. And right. You, so you have to ask the question: What is it of true significance that got these different people from different walks of life to all? within a relatively historically short time period produce documents around the same individual which there i mean I'm, i know i'm saying this as a christian but you would be a christian if you believe this which is that there is continuity there and the way i look at it just to give you a quick example is you know when, when you look at the letters from the sinking of the rms titanic a lot sometimes they have very different accounts now i would say they don't conflict, I would say they harmonize, but you might have one passenger who writes a letter and they describe the process of the boat sinking and getting off it as very calm. You might have another passenger describe it as very hectic, you know, and, and that's because there was probably a time at the beginning when people didn't really understand what was happening and they were calm. And then as it went on, it got more hectic. And the point is those, those letters exist because something truly significant happened. And I would say that's my understanding of the New Testament. When you try to explain what it is in any regard, you have to try to get at the idea of what is it that would be so significant can something that, that would is, launch this off the ground. Nick, can something that is yeah. false be, can, be still written about and motivated by people to yes. do it? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So Christianity could also be false. And yet, still be have this motivation of people to do it, right? Um, could also be false. The problem is, you're asking. I understand what you're asking, and I and I can agree with you. But the thing is, the reason I'm a Christian is because I've become like there are people who believe in the resurrection because they believe the Bible, and then there are people who believe the Bible because they believe in the resurrection. Meaning, mm -hmm. some people just come through belief. Some come through a slow plot process. So why do you believe? It. I mean, that's been a 20-year story. Um, do you know I, why I you believe? Yeah, I would point to some of the things I, I pointed to earlier. I would point, my personal understanding is that the counterexamples, like the ones you laid out, okay. I don't find particularly convincing. I also think... Can you think of a counterexample that you would find convincing? Um... It would, it would have to be an example that would make sense of two things. Uh, a tangible example would be if we found um, some sort of ancient, it would be a combination of these two things. It would be ancient documents or copies of the gospels that had very serious differences um, between the manuscripts, and I mean like... What do you mean by serious differences? Changing, um, if, if you had a copy of the Gospels, say, from, um, let's say within weeks or months of the, the assumed time period, and it had... Can you, can you refresh? No, no <coughs> miracles in it. Different, I guess, words in G. Um, yeah, you're breaking up. Out? Yeah, you're breaking up. Refresh and come right back. Uh, how, do I, how do I refresh? Top left, the arrow. If you Are you in your mobile? That's too bad. See if he comes back. Christopher Hatch and there was other people wanted in. I'll try to end this quickly. We'll see if he comes back. Thanks for the donation, Welsh backgammon. Jay Smith uncovered thirty different Arabic Qurans.
Nick, if you can hear me, well, you probably can't because you don't have the YouTube tab open anymore. But so far, what I'm hearing from Nick is everything's fuzzy to him. Um, he's talking about continuity, motivations, personal experiences. I don't think Nick even knows why he believes. And then when I asked him about <coughs> what would... What would be a good uh, counter evidence to what his beliefs? He's talking about major differences, or would you say serious differences? I wonder if he's aware of the long ending to Mark. Like, does he consider that a serious difference? My guess is he's going to say no. It has to be contradictory, and the long ending to Mark is not contradictory. So my guess is, when I the very first thing I asked him was, is it possible that Christianity is false? He said no, but then he backed off that and said 99.9% .9 true. Maybe there's a small chance it's false. But it's really hard to get him to say anything that I can latch on to why he believes it. I wouldn't be surprised if, Nick, if you hear this, or if you can come back, I wouldn't be surprised if you had addictions in your life or um, some type of tragedy. I would love to talk about these motivations because you talked about motivations for why people would write the New Testament. What are the motivations for you to accept it? Pine Creek theorem? I don't know. Okay, three... Hurry up, Nick. Two. One. Christopher Hatch. Hi, Christopher. Uh, Doug, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hey, what? so um, I'm a pantheist. I think I probably most closely align to like T-Jump. That, you know, I kind of like default to, you know, theism is probably a quantum field and Etc. So I'll tell you where I sit uh, first. But I heard uh, an interesting argument from, uh, I guess you'd call him like a new age crank, but you know, he's not an evangelical theorist or anything. But uh, he came up with an argument that you've probably heard before, but I was hoping you could deconstruct for me that, I don't know, seems interesting. And that was he made the argument, well, you know, human beings. Through our senses, we can only hear up to like a certain frequency in like hertzes, or we can only see like so many uh, uh, colors of the color spectrum. Like uh, we think that we can perceive, um, you know, like uh, our tactile senses and stuff. But he's like, even that can be tweaked a little bit from your inner ear, like your vestibular system when you have an ear infection. Why are you telling me this stuff? So essentially his argument was that like, how can we have, you know, absolute certainty about anything if, if the human body essentially can't perceive all the senses at all? Like, we know. don't need certainty. I spit on the face of certainty. Yeah. Okay. I just wasn't sure if you had heard that, you know, argument before. Even so. if I did hear it, I probably would totally disregard it within two seconds. <laughs> um, gotcha. All right. Yeah. So you know, I'm still. Um, I you know, I used to be an evangelical Christian, but uh, you know, now like like I said, I like you and T Jump are pretty much the only guys I tune into regularly. So definitely deconverted me, but um, you know, still. So do you call yourself an atheist? Uh, yeah, like a soft atheist, I guess. Okay. Uh, you know, but like, if there's pantheism. Is that a form of atheism or is pantheism theism? Well, naturalistic pantheism is supposed to be a form of theism in a way, but T-Jump just uses it as an outsider test for faith for um, helping it, <laughs> uh, combat uh, specific theism. Just sort of like a, as a placeholder for argument's sake. Yeah. I got it. Okay, well, that's all, that's all I had for you. When do you do—I'd um, love to discuss politics. When's your next politics stream? 
I don't schedule things because I don't let social media control me. I control it. So I, um, I had one last night. I'm not sure when the next one will be. All right. Well, are, are you a, a granola cruncher, tree hugging, blood gushing out of the heart liberal? <laughs> no, like I guess you, I'd characterize myself as like a big L liberal, like a neoliberal, sort of like a centrist liberal, I guess you could say. Uh, I tried to think of just to cite an example of someone I kind of align with. You know, I voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, you Sorry, know, I just had a sugar. I, yeah, like, um, so I guess, you know, I'm not progressive. I don't identify with Bernie Sanders or anything. But I'm Okay. Just, or why do you want to talk to me about politics? Um, just because, you know, I just think that um, you're... You, uh, I wanted to sort of carve out a little bit of like the cleavage on cleavage. Like, yeah. Of like uh, Canadian conservatism versus, I know you live in Arizona, I think. Right. But you know, if, if Canadian conservatism is more or less aligned with like U S conservatism, no, no, they're different. Yeah. That's what I was on to like kind of ask you about um, and how they were different, you know, I just, One's, uh, it's just a shift, either left or right. So uh, a conservative Canadian would probably be closer to a moderate American. Got it. Yeah. I'd say, like, I pretty much vote down. Okay, that was fun. Uh, Nick, if you still want to call in, you can. But you were breaking up a lot. And um... <clears throat> sorry, uh, whatever your name was with the white T-shirt undershirt. There's Nick back. Nick, are you there? See, a true Christian would pay his internet bill. Pay unto Cox Cable what's due to Cox Cable. Can you imagine if Cox Cable and Dick's Sporting Goods merged? Cox and Dick's. <laughs> Nick! Are you there? Can't hear you. The Lord is protecting you from me. The Lord says, let's put an angel, a guardian angel, on that internet connection. Have you ever debated another famous atheist about anything? Would be interesting to see you debate Matt Delante. Yeah, that would be interesting. But I don't like debating because, like I said earlier, I don't even schedule my stuff, let alone take the time to prepare for a formal debate. But if Matt Dillahunty or, or another a famous atheist, whatever that means, wants to um, just have a conversation with me, that's fine. Me and Matt agree on the most things. I think he's wacko on the trans thing. Um, and he also, I don't like that he doesn't give a, a marker what would change his mind. Oh, God would know. <coughs> Any other callers? I, there was a couple other people who called in and then left because I was talking to Nick too long. Yeah, Matt Dillahunty wouldn't even, I think, talk to me because he thinks I'm the devil. Which is weird, because he doesn't believe in devils. Except for me. Like, my guess is I could just say, trans women are not real women, and he would run for the hills. I cannot platform this atheist. Okay, one more try, Nick. Hello. There, you're back, finally. Oh. Uh, you gotta pay your uh, internet bill, Nick. <laughs> I heard you saying that to me, and I was like, 
You can't hear me? Please. Uh, is it all right to call you Doug, by the way? I hear other people. Yeah, Doug's fine. Past tense okay. of Dick. Uh, okay. And where we left off is I asked you about yes. uh, evidence that would make you think that yes. the Bible is not reliable, whatever. And you start talking about transcripts. And so I was going to ask you about the long ending of Mark um, in the original oldest, most reliable uh, older manuscripts. The last eight verses are not there, but then they uncovered a new uh, manuscript that had uh, additional eight verses. It's not contradictory, but the problem is the early Christians thought what they were reading was the full book of Mark. And then a new batch of Christians, uh, I don't know, maybe a century later, had a new, improved uh, Mark. That doesn't bother you? Um, no, I mean, it, it doesn't. I think because I, I know actually a lot of pastors. I mean, you've reviewed James White. I know he doesn't even accept the end of Mark. Uh, he won't teach from that specifically okay. for the reason you're you're listing um at least that's what i remember hearing him say but i think you can also make sense out of that um like i hate to say it i i feel like a lot of these things might sound like convenient excuses but this really is to me a plausible case which is that um if the events of the gospel of mark actually happened and the people didn't understand exactly you know, if they thought maybe Christ is coming back at any time, they might end it abruptly to leave the reader on the cliffhanger of, well, wait a second, what happened to Jesus? Because at that time, many people would have been spreading the news like this guy came back, he's coming back again. And as the generations die off, if you want to preserve. Yeah, um, Nick, Nick, you're starting to fade on me again. That you may try to find an economical way. Oh, come on. Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm fading again? You're not as bad as last time, but I can hear it coming. Oh. But we need to speed this up just in case I lose you again. Oh, no. I, I get the... Yeah. How, old well, were okay. you, how old were you when you I'll became a Christian? Call back. Probably around 20, and I'm a 39 now. Okay. And uh, what happened at age 20 that led you to Christ? Well, I think initially it was just the startling nature of the claim. Uh, I thought it had incredible explanatory But why did you even care about the Bible in the first place to read the claim? Uh, that's going to get us into a question about, uh, that's going to go down Calvinism, I guess, in the new birth. I would say it was God prompting me. But you didn't know about Calvinism at that time. So my question is, imagine no. you're 20 years old. Why did you even care about the claim? Why did you even look into it? Um, it had, to me, extraordinary explanatory power as to why people hate death. Did you hate death? Short. Were you scared of death at yeah. age 20? Um, yeah. Did an did yeah. accident happen? Uh, no, not that I remember. Did you have this no. uh, this existential angst, fear of death at age 19, at age 18, at age 17? Like something happened at 20. Why weren't you a Christian at 18, you think, versus 20? Well, I just wasn't exposed to it. I, I, I went to a church. I didn't pay attention. There you go. You I went to a church at age 20. Why did you go to that church at age 20? Well, I didn't. I, a fear was actually the answer. I was in New York City, um, and I heard a... Uh, undercover drug bust go south my second night there a cop got shot i was out in the city some months later with two friends and i wanted to go back to brooklyn i went to pratt institute i want to go back to brooklyn um but they wanted to stay in the city i didn't want to go back by myself and they were going to a church okay so your and friends so took you to church it. yeah i stomached it and went to the church were your friends christians uh one of them was one of them wasn't Okay, so you, you they, go, they just wanted to go to this church because it was kind of popular. They wanted to go to church because it was popular. Yeah, the speaker. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tim Keller. Yeah, very familiar yeah, with Tim it was, Keller. Yeah, it was his church. So. Okay, so you went to Tim Keller's church, a yes. nice, a nice progressive uh, evangelical. Um, <laughs> Depending on who you ask, sure. Yeah, he's kind of yeah progressive, but um, and you heard something in that church that day. Um, not that day, 
day, but it was, well, he said some things that made me think, and I, and I can remember wanting to kind of go back and, and listen to him again, and and then eventually, a couple months into it, I got a Bible, because I thought, I don't know why these people keep talking about this Christ person as if he's more significant than everyone else, so I just better read it for myself and figure out what it says. Okay. And yeah. then I understood the claim. That was really why I converted. It was reading Matthew, um, I think it's 18 or 19, I'm trying to remember. It's the rich man who comes to Christ and says, what must I do to get into heaven? I'm sure you know the story. Yeah. He says, um, you know. Give everything anyway, away. He goes through the, yep, he goes through the whole list. And the rich man says, all these things I've done since my youth. And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, if you want to enter heaven, leave what you have and come follow me. And I remember in the study Bible, when, when Peter then prompts Christ saying, uh, Christ says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Okay, but you're, 20 year, you're, you're about 20 years old at this time, right? And you're reading Matthew mm -hmm. 18. Did it, the thought occur to you that this might just be a story and not true? Sure. And at age 20, not now, but at age 20, what made you think it was or led you down the road that this is true? I, I remember a couple of nights when I just prayed and I said, look, God, I don't know if you're there. Um, there. Now we're getting to the real reason, Nick. Okay. So I you're, said, I don't know. If, you're praying. Sure. What happened? I said, if you are there, I don't want to think anything about you that's wrong. I'm told that your life, had, that you have something to do with Christ. I don't want to join a cult. I don't want to get swept up in something wrong. But if uh, you're there, if Christ has something to do with it, I would ask that you please help me understand that on your timeline. And um, over time, as I continue to read the Bible, I would say, in addition to that, I began to experience something that I would say uh, is the tangible experience of the Holy Spirit and the regeneration of my heart. And what was this experience like of the Holy Spirit? Well, that, I mean, this is the tough part because that is what it's like. I mean, if I tried to compare it to something else, I would inevitably fall into like something emotional or sort of sensory experience. But this is kind of unique. I mean, it is, well, I just, guess in a material way, the easiest way to think about it is it's almost like the experience of falling in love. But it's not quite that. It's, it's um, yeah, a tangible experience of the Holy Spirit is the way to describe what it's like. Okay, and I'm going to do this quickly. This is outside of Test for sure. Faith. Um, sure. I want you to be very honest but with But I also you. have questions I want to ask you, so I'll call back another time. Uh, if, if someone who believes in a false religion uh, but has this type of fear of death that, like you did at age 20, goes into this church, but it's not a Christian church, it's a false religion church, and they're intrigued and they start to learn more and then they go home and they pray to this false god um to pre to to help them understand these claims in this false uh in the these false texts and then over time you know over the next few months they experience something does they get this uh, feeling or intuition or idea and they they actually do think i, I am starting to understand this stuff but it's all false do you think that happens in in the world? I would, yeah, I would. I would not be surprised. Okay, if so if it happens like in this world and it's yeah. false, mm -hmm. then it could happen to you, and it still be false, right? Uh, yeah, I think the case for Christianity is a little bit more airtight than that, but I, I understand where you're going with it. Yeah, and like, I would say. You you, yeah, bas the, you basically what you what you did was you had a desire to go down that path. You prayed to God. Just the fact you asked God to help you understand it showed you had this desire, probably because of your fear of death or some type of existential angst. Tim Keller is great at that. He's great at at trying to appeal to atheists uh, this and pull out of them this existential angst. I heard him talk to the Google employees. He's magnificent mm -hmm. at that. Yeah. Try try to bring out meaning and purpose and hope to people that he views has none and so so basically you use christianity as a way to solve this need in you 
I could say the same thing about atheism. Okay, go ahead. And the, and the point the point I'm making is that um, I think every worldview is going to involve some level of desire on the part of the people that adopt it. Um, I think that's going to be in, in Okay, let me tell you my case. Sure, sure. My case is I would be way better off if I was a Christian. My wife is a Christian, a born again evangelical Christian. I my by me leaving Christianity, I caused her a lot of tears, pain and turmoil and my family, my mom, my dad, everyone. If I could force myself to be a Christian again, it would make life so much easier. But I became convinced that's not true. Um, if I, as an atheist, I die, uh, I don't believe I'll ever see my family again. Now, I don't want to live forever, but um, there's no, I, I don't, that's it. We're dead, done, I'm going to be maggot food. If I get sick with stage four cancer tomorrow, I don't believe there's any God that's going to heal me. Whereas a Christian has that hope. Well, maybe God's going to intervene here. I know he doesn't usually do it, but maybe he will do it for me. I don't have that hope. So tell me now, I think atheism is, athe atheism is nothing. It provides um, no eternal hope, no eternal purpose, no eternal meaning. But right. you can still have meaning on this earth. So I think right. the atheist community is nothing. There's nothing to bind against. I think to find community in atheism is extremely difficult. When I, if I move to a new city and I'm an atheist, good luck finding community as easily as Christianity. So what is this drive for me to be an atheist? <laughs> well, I don't, the thing is, I would ask you questions. I wouldn't tell you anything. I would talk about um, what the drive was for me as I kind of deconstructed from agnosticism and atheism. And I would, from, I'm talking for me personally, one of the big motivators, because I, I could say the same thing about my walk with Christ. I'm the only Christian in my family, you know? Okay. So that sort of alienation is, um, it goes both, everybody experiences exactly. Did what they cry I because, think. because you became a Christian? No, no. I got you there. Distance yeah, <laughs> themselves from me. Yeah, no, and I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm sorry you went through that, man. That's that is. Tough. Oh yeah, it was rough. At least but for I think six, the, twelve months. The basically the big appeal for atheism for me, um, especially as a young guy, was the ability to sleep uh, around. Follow. Yeah, follow my own passions yeah. any way I want. Well, not just that, but just, I mean, sheer, like, follow my own ambitions. There was nothing, there was no check on my own impulses. And I think that is incredibly um, intoxicating. Well, you know, and my I kids are atheists. I got two kids. They're both atheists. One's 20, one's 18. In the prime of their hormonal cycles and stuff. Well, maybe not the daughters. I think they peak later. But, um... So far, so good. No sleeping around, no STDs, no desire to go out partying and make these stupid mistakes that most kids make. My kids are very, I've taught them to think first before they act. I taught them not to get, uh, not to touch drugs or alcohol and they haven't. I mean, they're, they're probably more moral in the Christian sense than most Christians and they're atheists. Well, they do have a Christian mother praying for them, so. Well, there no, you go. I mean, I'm. <laughs> I'm, it's a joke. It's a joke, but no, I, no, hear, that, I hear you. That that could be an explanation, or it could be the explanation that that they've got a great disposition, and you're a great father, and well, that's you know, obvious. Well. But but like <laughs> when I was a when I was a Christian, I just always thought that the reason people uh, did these stupid things is because they didn't have Christ in their life. But now, as I'm older, no, they just make stupid mistakes. It's not Christ is, has nothing to do with it. Okay. Like you've yeah. seen, I'm sure you've seen Christians make horrible mistakes in life, and I'm sure oh, you've yeah. seen, and I'm sure you've seen atheists make horrible mistakes, and I'm sure you've seen yeah. Christians do wonderful things, and I'm sure you've seen atheists do wonderful things. Maybe. So mm -hmm. the the difference is not Christ. The difference is not the Holy Spirit guiding you to all truth. It's probably a ton of other factors, but it's mostly summed up as people make mis good choices and bad choices. Yeah. The, that's why it boils down to like what does it mean to make a good or bad choice and if if god exists and if christ is the son of god is it good to
acknowledge that or bad to acknowledge that. And that's why I would say like, that is, it is the central question. And I do agree with you that, um, look, I think it's also biblical to say that it's kind of um, a level field when it comes to humanity. People of every race and creed and stripe are going to be good and bad um, in some ways. That's, but you know, that you, is why you got a problem though, unique. Nick. Not, Nick, you yeah. got you got a huge problem here because Lay it on me. you admitted to me that you're, I think, well, you've hinted at least that you're a Calvinist Christian. Okay. Right. You're a Reformed Calvinist Christian. Yeah, insofar as my understanding of. The reform position is, okay. is accurate. So, yes. so hang on to your to your britches. Uh-oh. How well, did I just walk into? How can I become a Christian, Nick? Uh, it's like asking, how can I get born? Right. Well, no. The answer is you can't. Well, no, you can, but it's I can. That happens to you. Okay. Is it in my control? Right. Uh, my understanding is it's as much in your control as your your new birth is as much in your control as your original physical birth. Right. So now I, I think you've given the correct answers under Calvinism. Okay. So now here's the question for you. If I die an unbeliever, it's because of what God didn't do in me. True or false? Well, that's the second step, not the first. I if I saying, die an yeah. unbeliever yeah, yeah, and I go not to heaven... Mm -hmm. the ultimate reason why is because of what God didn't do in me. Is that true or false? Right. God chose not to, in effect, intercept your rebellion. Right. Yeah. Okay. So right. you're saying true. And I'm talking to you, but I'm saying that universally of, of everyone. I know, but we're going to keep it personal yeah. here. So now, Nick, oh, okay. sure. if you die a believer, it's because of what God did to you. To regeneration, right. He, right? Yes, he gets the credit, yes. Okay. I was not heading towards God at all. So why do you think God saying. picked you and not me in this scenario? Um, it has nothing to do with the differences in us. It's not because I'm better and you're worse. I know. It's because out of his but grace... Why do, why do you think he picked you? Well, my understanding is that he... He picks whoever he picks based on um, the counsel of his own will and to magnify his glory in the final analysis of all things. But he would magnify his own glory if he picked me too. Well, that's... Pers but, yeah, but see, here's, here's where we're going to potentially part ways is... Um, and I don't... The thing is, the future hasn't happened yet. I can't tell you if you're in or out, because I don't have access. To I know, I know. But, but in my God. hypothetical, I said, if you die a believer, right. if I die an unbeliever. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we're not talking then, about we might be, I might be a believer. Well, that would be, then, then I would say that's exactly the point that would be under debate is whether, what would or would not magnify his glory more or less is really not something that we can make a case for. Because we don't have, like, you can't make the case that it would magnify him more because you don't have access to his divine will. So I, but I think look, there's a little bit of presumption just in the line of reasoning, uh, you know. But, but you have a tough pill to swallow, I think. And you, the pill okay. you have to swallow is, do you believe God's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, all those the omni stuff that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Sure. This is the tough pill you have to swallow. You have to believe that God created the universe and with us in it, and then purposely through decree decided to choose some for eternal life and some for eternal damnation. Some what? People. Some rebels. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. Well, it doesn't it's, matter. It's... God created it, right? And he could have chosen not to create it. Well, and I would, I would just, I'll, I'll try to do this quickly because I know you want to maybe wrap up the call, but I'm happy to stay as long as you want. Um, my understanding is that the reason the first three words that God says to Adam is you are free is because God creates humanity initially in a free state, a truly free state. Humanity chooses of its own volition to rebel against God and we inherit whoa, the disease. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's oh, not what ahead. Calvinism teaches. Oh, it doesn't. Calvinism does not cheat teach that people freely choose to rebel um, because I am born in we have been born in a sinful nature right right 
I was getting to that part, yes. When I said freely chose, I'm speaking exclusively of Adam and Eve prior to the fall. I think after the fall, we inherit a sin nature uh, which prompts us to sin, yes. Okay, so you think the... Uh, well, you admit, I think, that God foresaw that Adam would fall and Eve and that si the uh, sinful nature yeah. would arise in humanity. Mm -hmm. He foresaw that there would be things like sin, rape, evil, murder, all that sort of thing. His he, own crucifixion. His yeah. own crucifixion. He saw all that bad stuff and good stuff and said, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this anyhow. Right. Yeah. And this is where I think you have a challenge, or your position, I should say. I want to keep it general, but you said make it specific. So here's one of the unsubstantiated assumptions that I think a lot of atheism is predicated upon when we get into things like evil, suffering, sin, stuff like that. And I would phrase it like this. Um, because I can't think of a reason for why God would allow humanity to fall into sin, or allow evil and suffering to exist for a time. Therefore, there can't be a reason. Or you could put it another way. Because I can't think of a good reason or a benevolent reason for why God would allow this to be the case. Therefore, it's not possible that a good or benevolent reason can exist. And here's the challenge. If you're dealing with a God who's omniscient, at that exact moment, you've got a God who can have reasons for doing things that you can't think of. And and so the, the assumption, I, I mean, there's just a, a, a lot of assumption in critiquing okay, Nick, basically a limited perspective uh, fallacy. It's, it's like... Nick, I could say, well, I, in order for me to become a Christian, yeah. I need to know those, that reason first. And if God's not going to provide it, then say la vie? Right, but you're effectively... And here's, here's the challenge. I have to say this. I'm not saying this on a moral level. I'm saying this on a strictly a technical level. Um, you got to speak a little it, faster for me oh, because we've been sure. going a long time and I need you to yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. Boom, 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 like 10 you seconds be, each. You, I think one of the things that needs to like, it's the pain of setting the bone. You, what we all need to do is get sync up with the idea that if there's a God, by definition, um, oh, I had it and then you said it. <laughs> oh, I have to know what that reason is. Yeah, yeah. I would just, I would just caution you against assuming any posture where effectively you become God and God becomes answerable to you. And I don't mean that on a moral level. I mean, it would have to be the case that if there's a God, we don't get to make any demands on God. And I okay. don't mean that in terms. I, I just mean that's the way, like well, that's the way your elbow works a but, certain way. But if like you believe, but if you believe in some type of free choice, then then people can. Uh, ask God questions, um, even use the word demand. Like uh, I think in the Old Testament, who demanded things of God, uh, kind of wrestled with God. Was it Elijah, Elisha? But um, what uh, what was I going to ask you? Yeah. They were if, prompted if, by God to do that. I, here's another pill I think you need to swallow, and that is God's okay with sin. Okay with sin. Yeah, I don't. I could probably see how, given given the way you've asked questions so far, I, I think I know what you mean, but I we would probably disagree. It, it's a broad enough question for there to be things that I would say both yes and no to. That, that's what I would say. I, I think he's okay with allowing sin to exist. For an, yeah, in my opinion, for, for an right. omnipotent being, um, there's no difference between allowing and causing. For omnipotent being, there's no difference between allowing and causing yeah um, especially in an ultimate sense i would want to know what you meant by that i'm not so for example i'm trying say, to understand what that means for, le, for example let, be thick. Let, let's say um a rapist rapes a woman and you might say god allowed that to happen for morally sufficient reasons or whatever the freedom you know to do what gives people right. freedom yeah uh, but yeah i would say if God knew every detail of this universe, what would happen in it, and decided to create it anyhow, he actually caused that rape. Because he could have chosen not to create it all. And then that rape wouldn't have happened. So well, there, there'd be no yeah. sin, no evil, no suffering, no bad stuff at all if God didn't create. That's just science. Yeah, so I've actually worked with 
people that have gone through that. And, uh, you know, some do, of them are Christians. Do you agree with what I just said? Um, there would be that, no sin, no rapes, no uh, murders, no pedophilia. None of well, that yeah, bad but, stuff if God didn't create. That's just science, right? Yeah, but you're you're talking like that's you're talking like act two is act three. And the point I would say is you said omnipotent being. What is, what are the implications of that? Are you saying that it's not possible for God to bring about uh, a final solution to that experience that would so remedy and rectify and reverse it? Even to the satisfaction of the victim. Okay, I mean, I'm a Christian, and no, so I like. Yeah, that's possible, Nick. Even the worst suffer evil, so that's part of the cross okay. and resurrection. Okay, but Nick, you you, you, know. you got a third pillar swallow now because you're saying that okay. that these evils and injustices can be rectified for, but you also said earlier that God chooses some for election for heaven and some for he destruction hell, right? So now imagine well, some rebels, yeah, rebels. So now imagine the woman being raped, but mm -hmm. she never is chosen and not God's elect. Not only does she suffer in this life, but the one to come. How, yeah. how is she rectified? How is she uh, atoned for? How is she get paid back? It, um, I would say the, the reason people end up in a godless eternity, and I'll speak about this woman, I'm not trying to dodge it, but I just... No, but I asked you a very specific question because you made yeah. the comment that, that God could have this greater good. You made a greater good argument that God well, al allows this evil and stuff because he can make it but right. But you're baking into it certain attributes of what hell is like, what a Christless or godless eternity is like. And what I'm saying is <laughs> there's a reason why in the Bible. Um, is separation the, from God bad? Uh, yeah, of course. Okay, this woman's raped and then separated from God in the afterlife. Bad on earth, bad in the afterlife. I how, is, ask, how is she paid back? Oh, I don't, I don't know by what uh, mechanism God would intend to remedy the suffered evil of, like an individual suffered evil that is not her fault um, with something that is, if she, if anybody, any woman or any man, anybody, ends up in a godless eternity, it's not like they're asking to be with God. I, I mean, that's... You're the, saying she deserves it. it. I'm saying if you walk up to the top of the Empire State Building and you walk off, you're going to run into the law of gravitation. I know, but Nick... If you rebel against God, you're going to... I'm pushing back hard. Eternity. I'm pushing back hard on your claim. Oh, by all means, go for it. I'm, and yeah. there's a delay, so we got to end this soon. Um, oh, Because the delay is getting worse and worse. Um... I'm pushing back hard on your claim that God will make things right. And I've given you a very specific example of a woman who's been raped and let's say traumatized for the rest of her life because she was raped as a kid, goes through tremendous mental anguish, then dies and is separated from God in eternity, which you admit is bad. Her whole entire life on earth has been a hell, and then her afterlife is a hell. God made the universe in such a way that and he knew this would happen, and he made it anyhow. How is this woman paid back? You said, I don't know. But are you still saying she is going to be paid back? I think there is um, there's stuff in the Bible that would heavily implicate that in the final analysis, nobody is getting away with anything. No, no person, no man. I'm not talking about the raper. Do. I'm talking. Right. I'm talking about the the rapee. Right. And that and that's what I mean is is, um, I mean, there's some debate on this in Christian circles. I haven't thought about it much, but well, you need to think about this because this is the real problem yeah, of, of evil. Of why would God create a universe? Well, you're that presenting would a hypothetical though. That and and what I'm saying is, when you read, for example, Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, and you see Lazarus who is constantly looked over and, and neglected, uh, which I think is a form of abuse by the rich man. The rich man ends up in hell. One of the most startling things about him is that he never asks to leave. I mean, in any situation in this life, if we experience need to speed real up. pain or, or real uh, trauma or something like that, we try to get, get out of it. You know, we try to get away from the thing that's causing us pain. The rich man is the biblical account. The one guy biblical account that we have of a guy in hell 
is a guy that's never asking to get Why are you out. saying these things to me? Because what because the point uh is that is is to understand the nature of what the biblical hell is. It's not a place I that I don't need to, to because leave. as soon as you said to me that separation from God is bad, we're mm -hmm. done. I don't even care if whether it's sulfur and burning or torture, doesn't matter. What you've admitted to me that is if a woman is raped, I think you would agree that's bad. Of course. And she can go through her whole I've life. I've worked with people that have gone through okay, that. Okay, that's fine. And, yeah. and then when she dies, it doesn't get any better because she's now separated from God if she's not one of the elect. So this is a problem you have in your worldview that you, I, I would think, have to have some type of cognitive dissonance that you believe God's loving, you believe God's just, but at the same time, you're, and you believe God's omniscient, and omnipotent, all these things, and yet at the same time creates a world that he knows with certainty that a woman like this will have hell on earth and then hell in the afterlife, and he creates that world anyhow. I'm just trying to find an example of the kind of person you're talking about. I understand oh my. on a hypothetical. I think we should right? end it there then. If, okay. if, you, if you don't even think that in your worldview that's possible, is that where you're going with this? No, I, what I'm saying is you're presenting a hypothetical. You're, you're bringing two things into the equation. I'm just trying to make sure we're on the same page regarding the nature of hell. No, it, the nature of hell is irrelevant if you admit that separation from God is bad. Okay. Well, then we might, you know, I've had this experience before where I call into programs and then I listen to it afterward and I go, oh, I'm tracking with this a lot more listening to this than just like kind of listening it in the, in the moment. So I, I'm happy to say you're probably making your point very clear and I'm just not tracking with it no i think it. you are tracking with it and okay. you just but you are at a loss on how to defend it then let me help you nick sure the way you defend what i against what i'm saying is you say but maybe god didn't know the future and you become an open theist or you say but maybe god didn't have free will not to create because part of his nature is creation and so he had no choice and he had to create Maybe you'll take some Molinist view and say God knew all the possibilities of what would happen, but didn't know for sure what the the actualization of it. Or you can okay. say that in order for God to fully demonstrate his love or fu fully demonstrate his uh, justice and to fully get glory, he had to create a world this way in order to get things. But then you're admitting that God is not self-sufficient and that he's not all loving prior to creation. He's not all just prior to creation because he actually needs to demonstrate it to mere mortals in order to get that. So there are outs for you, but you haven't even begun to think about them. Well, and... and if we're going to make a list of possibilities, we can also say like, you know, maybe you want to reconsider being an atheist for the simple reason that you seem to have very strong convictions about right and wrong. And on atheism, there really is no objective basis for right and wrong. <laughs> oh, you can't say that just before you leave. <laughs> I, I, I can. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to stay as long as you want, but I think good and evil. P.F. Young, give me a few more minutes now. Um, okay, good. Uh, I'll, yeah, because I like talking to you. I know it can get contentious, but I actually, you're like one of the few fresh breaths of air in this space. And so it's really nice to talk H to you. How do you, yeah. Nick, Nick, uh, on a day-to-day -day level, how do you judge whether something's objectively wrong or not? Ah, that's a multifaceted answer. I mean, there's intuition. There's intuition. what I understand the, the Bible to be saying. You the know, Bible? I would say... Uh, my understanding of right and wrong are the product of being made in the image of of God. Yeah, like the law written on your heart, maybe? I just mean by design. I, I think that's part of our design. How is that different than intuition? I think intuition is an extension of that. Okay. So if you and I are walking down the street and we see someone uh, pull a knife out of their jacket and stab a woman in the heart, would you say that's objectively wrong? Uh... I'm a, I, well, I'm, I mean, based I, on that information, I guess, yeah, my initial impulse would be, okay. you know, I would provided she's not attacking them or trying to kill them, then, yeah, if it's just... Yeah, okay, it's them. not self-defense. Right. You would say that's objectively wrong. Okay, now I'm going to add in a new piece of information. God okay. commanded the person to kill her. Okay. Question, is it objectively wrong? Uh, I mean, the hypothetical... <laughs> 
Lean I yes, lean no. No, I, I, I'm going to say... You brought up the objective I, morality I, here. Is it objectively well, wrong to kill a woman if God truly commanded it? I don't, I don't believe that would happen. That's the problem. Hey, I know that sounds like Nick, such a Nick, duck and such a dodge. Nick, uh, but I like you many that's, times. That's part of the issue, Nick. Many times in this live stream, you said if Christianity is true, if God is real, if Christianity is true, if God is real, mm -hmm. I'm doing the same thing back at you now. If God okay. commanded the stabbing of a yep. woman. Would you say that's objectively wrong? It's a rhetorical question, is it not? I I do understand. Uh, if I'm, I'm trying to, I'm you're trying a Calvinist. To true. Be have yeah. a backbone. Say no. Then Doug, it is right. Not only is it not wrong, it is morally good. That's what you should answer as a Calvinist. I don't know about that actually. Um, what? Everything yeah, that God wills, commands, well, decrees. No, no, but you keep, yeah, but this is the point that I'm trying to make, is you keep using the word God to describe something different from my conception of God. That's ah, so are and you telling sort of, me the God of the Bible who drowned almost everybody on the planet is not capable oh, of God. commanding a murder? Is that what you're saying, um, so, Nick? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That last part, I did genuinely lose. The God of the Old Testament who drowned people, and then I lost that part. Okay, yeah. are you telling me that God would not, in his nature, command such a thing? Uh, my understanding is now that the canon is closed, oh. people don't hear the voice. Or, every, everything we understand about God between now and either our death this is the or sweet, his return. Nick, I've is, heard this many times. This is, the, yeah, yeah. this is called the sweet spot apologetic. God yeah. in the past would command something like this, and God in the future in the Revelation might command something like this. But we're in the sweet spot where God wouldn't do anything like that anymore. Is every single part of a story exactly the same? No. Or does it vary? It varies. Right. So if God is telling a story with history, why would we expect uniformity? Why would we so my, Weren't my you the guy who is, talked about consistency about an hour ago? <laughs> in, in, which, in, in what context? I mean, we're, we might be talking about something else now. But I want to know, my, I want to know the answer to my question without dodging a question. I don't believe in objective case. morality. Right. So nothing, that, so nothing in the Bible is truly wrong. You don't, you don't what do you mean by truly? Objectively. You don't what do you mean by objectively? Uh, stance independent. Stance independent of what? Universally true. Universally, uh, what, I, let me help you. You're talking independent of humans. I'm talking about independent of, subje of a subjective stance. I'm saying universally applied. Well, hang on. True in, all, true in all situations at all times. Okay, we got to define objective morality. Because if you say it's independent of a subjective stance, isn't God a person? Three persons? Well, yeah. Yeah. Isn't but that also, a subject? No, no. No? This comes up a lot. This this actually comes up a lot. Like all truth is subjective, even if it comes from God because God's subjective. That's only true of a subjective God. But that's not the kind of God that the Bible puts forward. Doesn't God have a nature puts, just like you and I have natures? A, some people call it a divine essence. Jesus says God is spirit. Well, some ladies in high school told me I had a divine essence too. <laughs> I, I don't doubt it um but uh but yeah i would say no it, it if if god is that from which all realities external to himself emerge either directly or indirectly then by definition he is objective okay he is stance i think i know what you mean by object, objective now but let me ask you this yeah. in order to make sure i we have the same definition is it possible for objective morality to exist without god uh no no so now listen to what you just did okay objective morality is god morality objective morality is god morality yeah because i asked you is it possible for objective morality to exist without god you said no so in essence right. Whenever you say the, the, the phrase objective morality or really wrong or truly wrong, what you really mean is God wrong, God morality. I think I see where you're going with this. And I think I this can is why the, the, the moral you. argument fails, by the way, 
because what, it's um, it's it's a tautology. It's circular. Walk me through it. If um, if objective reality exists, mm -hmm. God exists. Is that how the moral argument goes? Or is it the other uh, way? If God exists, objective morality exists. Object, premise two, objective morality exists. Conclusion, therefore God exists. I think that's the moral argument. One okay. version of it. But what I'm saying is, if you substitute the word, if you concede, or if you say that the only way objective morality can exist is by God, then basically you're saying, if God exists, God morality exists. Premise two. God morality God exists. Morality. Therefore... God exists. It becomes a tautology. Well, I would. I may, maybe we're saying the same thing here. I don't know, but I would say um, it's like the light of the sun emerging from the heat of the sun. <sighs> it's an extension of the nature. So, God as something that has aseity. I'm not denying that. I, I all right, I'm right. all I'm saying is when you uh -huh. say objective morality, in my brain, I'm thinking God mor uh, morality. That's it. Well, that's, I think that's... So if I don't believe God exists, then I don't believe this God morality exists. Right, which is why you don't have a problem with anything in any holy text, because it's not objectively wrong. Oh, hang on. <laughs> that's the point. Do you, think, do you think that just because I don't believe in God morality, that I don't believe in any morality? No, that's, that's a completely separate point. I'm no, saying no, it isn't, because you just made the claim that I shouldn't have anything wrong with no. any bad stuff in the bible R right but right I'm saying in terms of an account you cannot give an account for why something is objectively wrong you can absolutely give an account for why you would have a subjective view on that but what i'm saying is there's no i can give an account why why things are not god morality because i say god doesn't exist you can say that sure and you can say god does exist it's a push it's an account for why we have it in the first place. That's that's the point I'm making. Okay, are, so you're I saying would, if I can't give an account, then what? I can't say there's you morality? Don't, you don't have any mechanism by which to verify whether or not your inclination towards what's moral and what's not is accurately calibrated. Sure I can. Basically. So let's say I say that um, rape is wrong, okay? okay? And you ask me, how can you account for that? Well, under my standard of morality, uh, rape, not non-consensual sex, is wrong, okay? So I put that in a box beforehand. And this has nothing to do with God. This is me, my standard of morality, me, Pine Creek, standard of morality says rape is wrong. Then right. I can verify that objectively now that I have my standard in place. Let's say it's based on unnecessary suffering and that sort of thing. I see a man rape a woman. And I ask, is this consensual? And the woman says, no, help me. I'm being raped. And I look to my, I forgot my standard of morality. So I look at my piece of paper of what I have beforehand said is wrong. Oh, rape is wrong. I see this man. Ah, objectively, this is wrong. How's that? Uh, the problem you're going to run into is when somebody comes along, and, and I don't agree with this, I agree with you, that is not only wrong, that is a deep evil. But the problem is not everybody in the world feels that way. So when I say you can't, you, you cease to have a mechanism with which to verify it. Oh, I mean is, you're in trouble, I mean Nick. When, when somebody comes along and says, actually, Pine Creek, I don't think there's any problem with that. Okay, and you're, it fills a need. I have an impulse that Nick, I Nick, you're in trouble because this, you have that same problem. So you, let's say you were to tell me, uh, I say, you, let's say you say rape is wrong. And, I, and let's say, hypothetically, I disagreed with you. You, okay? and, I, you and I, okay. Agreed. Okay. And, and then I ask you, why is rape wrong? What would you say? Why is rape wrong, Nick? Uh, because it's evil and it goes against your design as an image bearer of God. Okay. You're t it's, it's a form of, I mean, there's a lot. Okay, watch this, saying. Nick. It's, it's a form of a, oh sorry did you say something yeah so watch this okay because okay. okay. you you made the accusation that um someone could come along and disagree with my standard it's well, a look, form of violence yeah well look at this nick i don't care okay. what your god says now what are you going to do what do you mean what am i going to do well what am i going to say you, to that person yes how are you going oh. to because you made the accusation that if 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 I use this type of morality 
where I, it's subjective to me, mm-hmm. then someone could easily come ar- along and say, I don't agree with your subjective morality. I agree with my subjective morality. That's the point you were making, yes? Right. Yeah. Now watch this. I don't care what your God says. Now what are you going to do? That's, that's completely separate from whether or no, not it's objective. Just wrong. like two humans can disagree on morality, what if mm-hmm. a human and a God disagrees on morality? Th- then the human is wrong. Obviously, <laughs> but how are you going to convince them? Convincing, okay. The or you objective, don't care about the convincing the objective, part. The objective truth of something is not dependent on universal persuasion. It's dependent on whether or not it's objective. But who truth. cares what the objective right. morality is if you can't get people to do it? So let's say but, God says okay, X is what wrong. What you can get people to do is separate from asking what is the basis what is the account for it that's what i'm getting at nick who cares about the foundation and the basis if people number one don't even know what it is number two decide not to follow it don't you have to go to practical implications don't you have to go to carrots and sticks no no because you because before you can get there you have to describe where the impulse comes from initially well i'll say well evolution via common descent that's where it comes from People are okay, screwed up. What is it that what is it that makes evolution be a common descent, an objective metric? When you say objective, I I'm not, immediately replace it with the word God. So nothing is the answer. Well, no, because because evolution is a process that came in. Oh, okay. Being if you want to go when, when the universe. So, but so if what you, I'm saying is so you're saying objectiveness in this sense is possible without God. By you asking that question, no, you're implying no. that. No, what I'm saying is. Uh, Evolution by universal common descent is a process that begins to exist. It cannot, therefore, be objective. What I'm saying, Nick, is that the ontology doesn't matter if, if, if you can't get a reliable epistemology. So if you... Is that, is that statement, the ontology doesn't matter? Is that an objective statement or a subjective? No, this is a subjective statement by me. Okay, so so it's not objectively true. When you say objectively so true, what you mean matter. is God true. No, no. Look. No. Think of it. Let's let's. Can you get objectiveness simple. without God? Uh, no, you. No. no that's the. Point. So whenever the you point say the word true. really, truly, or objective, I replace it with God. Because that's right, what you God mean. Is an objective, because he's an objective reality. Right. So. Let's say I let's say I grant all that to you. I I don't believe objective that. Objective is a descriptive term. Yeah. Let's say I grant that all to you, and I just say, "Who cares? Now what? What do you? I mean, what meaning does it have? You're not following. What does it matter, Nick? If God's the grounding of of objective morality, what does it matter? It matters because it actually is a basis for even believing that there's an object. To reality. But you're just being Otherwise, circular. Objective morality yeah. matters because then you can have a basis for objective morality. But I'm asking, what no, about no, no. objective God's morality matters? matters. Not, not objective reality. God's existence matters. Why do, okay, I, again, back it up. What, can yeah. you, actually, let me ask you this. Can you ground God's sure. existence? Like, can why does God exist? God, um, God is the ground of existence. In the Christian worldview. It's not a... It's not a. It's not. Can he be grounded? It's because he's God. He is the. Ground so you're saying that he can't be grounded. Of nature. I'm sorry. That, say that last part again. Can God be grounded? What is the grounding for God's existence? God as a self-existence. That that's what the first verse of the Bible. You is said grounding is important, and now we can't even ground yeah. God. No, no. I'm not saying we can't. Okay. Anything you would ground him in would be greater than him, right? By definition. So. The point is because he would be conditional to what's grounding him. Right. So My you you is, at least admit that one thing, God, can't be grounded. So in he can't. I mean, no. I would say God is the ground. Is is the ultimate. Let me ask it differently. Why does okay. God exist? Why does God exist? I, yeah. I, I, I think you're running into the same problem because you seem to be suggesting. And maybe As a Christian, how would you answer that? Why does God exist? Um, it's not answered by a why. It's that God exists is, is the statement. 
that he's a, a necessary entity, I guess, is how ah, philosophers would talk yeah. about it. But I don't, Good. not a philosopher, but... Um, yeah, no, that's, that's the only answer you can give. It's because a brute fact, God's necessary. But in, I, as an aside, right. when it comes to the universe and nature and so forth, the, the why does the cosmos exist? Same answer. Mm -hmm. Brute fact, necessary. We don't need no God. And I would say the same thing with objective morality. Objective morality is, is useless yeah. because you will still have to ask questions that are contextual, subjective. Okay. Like, but, every, but the problem, Doug, is that everything you say after that is subjective. That's the so problem. what? Subje I'm saying subjective but, but is better so, than so objective. You, okay, but the, when it comes the, to morality, the moment you say that, it doesn't. The so what is that anything goes because anyone Whoa. can appeal to. This How did you is jump to that? Because do you anyone, think I say anything goes? No, no, Doug. Okay. The, the whole. My point is not what you personally believe. My point is that you don't have an objective grounds to tell someone else that I don't need it. Believe. I don't need it. Oh, hang but on. You, what you just said okay. was really cool, and I, okay. I, I take it back. Okay. There is one advantage to your belief system with objective morality, because you can say something I can't. You can say, uh -oh. this is bad because daddy said so. I can't say that. Uh, okay, I mean, <laughs> I, would, I would. But that's ultimately that. That's basically what it ends up being, right? I can tell you what to do with no, your life not. because this is objectively wrong, and Daddy said so. And this is why objective morality is better than subjective morality because we got gravitas. No, I wouldn't say said so. I would say it's an extension of his nature. But who the cares about God's have... nature and his extensions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, I'm thinking about my wife. She has extensions. Okay, I just I want you to ask. I'm I'm thinking about the question you're posing me, and pose it to yourself. Anything you would say about why something's right or wrong, Doug, the Doug, a, a pie, another Pine Creek comes along, right? Mm -hmm. a, a different, an inverted version of you. Because I agree with you, and I have the same impulses of you, and I think we have a, I yeah. think we have an objective ground for that. But now we have an inverted Pine Creek who comes along, and says, Doug, so what? So you think this is bad? Who cares? It's just subjective. I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna. Okay. So in a, I, I get your question, but you need to make it a little more specific. So let's say um, X happens. It's a it's a, um, a, a, a action between two humans, and I take one stance and say this is moral, and then the anti Doug says it's uh, immoral. So I say who, moral. Or he just says who cares? Or who why cares? Do I yeah. Care what you think. A, and if the person says who cares to me, then guess what? I will have to take the hard work. Let's say it's really important to me. I will have to take the stance of doing hard work to convince them, to try to appeal to goal setting, to try to appeal to common values. And I might fail, but at least that's what I would try to do. I would try but to that, say... That's look, my point. I, I would use why things is, like... Why is goal setting objectively good? I never said what it if was. I think objectively good? Okay, so what if all the basis with which you would argue. And I'm cutting you off. I apologize. No, 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 it's, it's fine. I, I prefer 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Yeah. It's what is whatever you would list. Why? Why should I care about that? If Again, I, I would say so. Let's say um, let's say it's a morality between apples and oranges uh, to make it simple. And I sure. say and I view apples as moral and um, oranges as immoral. And you say, no, I don't care about apples. I actually prefer oranges. I mean, I think oranges are moral. What I well, would no, it's that I see oranges as moral and I see apples in, as yeah. immoral. And so let's say we is, have this fight, right? And and right. we disagree. What both of us have to do at this point is give arguments, maybe evidence of why oranges are moral and apples are immoral or vice versa. We would actually have to talk it out. What, but the problem you have when you start appealing to objective morality, you have, well, actually, it's the same thing. Because a person like me can say, who cares what God thinks? And then you, you have to appeal to my values. You would have to appeal to arguments and evidence to show you. So this is why I say the ontology doesn't matter when it comes to morality. It's the epistemology. Number one, how do we even know what this God says is moral or not? Number two, do we have any reliable method? And even if we do, why ought we obey him? Yeah, and any reason you would give would be subjective. Yes, that's and I think subjective is better. But that it goes both ways. It, it's like, that's the thing that I think that 
I, and maybe I'm just not understanding you, but the thing that I think is being missed here is there is no way. Let's let's suppose you convince somebody. You have you and you have the other Pine Creek, and he thinks oranges are moral, apples are immoral. You think apples are moral, oranges are immoral. If you end up convincing him, all that's happened is a transition in subjective understanding of what's right and wrong. It doesn't tell you that what actually happened is right or wrong. It just tells you that a change has happened, not whether or not yeah, the change I agree with that. has happened is right or wrong. And I that's agree. the point I'm making. There's yeah. no basis. Right. Why, so, why do so, I need a basis? So I can just say, because, well, this is really wrong. Okay, because, in a, because if we're going to use hypotheticals, in the hypothetical where you have two people talking and one of them says murder's wrong and the other one says no, and the person who says, I think murder is moral, is good, if they end up convincing the other person, then by your logic, what we should go with is the idea that mo that murder is moral. It's not. That that's the point I'm making. Is the reason that it that it's always wrong. It's always objectively wrong. Is because we have an objective ground for the morality. Well, when yeah, when you say always, you mean through all, all time and history, right? right Absent of any context. Are discovered, not not. Invented. Okay, so let, let me ask you this. Let's get a specific example, and then we'll wrap it up. Because uh, yeah, there's some. I gotta go celebrate my dad's seventy fourth birthday oh. in a little bit. So, um, gonna... would since you've kind of defined this objective morality as something that's outside of humans that spans all time frames, is stoning of the practicing homosexual always always wrong in all times in all <sighs> contexts? Oh, Doug, it's been great talking to you. No, That's Nick. Great time. <laughs> Nick, don't bail. Uh, you can bail I, in five minutes, but please I answer know, this. Um, I, you want to ask it again? Is it objectively wrong to stone the practicing homosexual? My, my genuine answer to you is because there is debate over this specific topic. Lean yes, lean realm, no. Within the realm of Christianity... I'm not yet prepared to give an answer to that question. I would lean always wrong. Oh, oh, you know what? Actually, let me think about this because of the way you <laughs> worded it. I would say always wrong. Um, stoning. Are you saying for the practice of homosexuality or are you saying someone who happens to be? No, for the practice. Uh, okay. I'm not... Grounding doesn't yeah. matter so much now, does it? Uh, what do you mean? Is that <laughs> is that um, is that in the Bible? What the stoning of practicing homosexuals? Yes. Okay. You didn't know that. Well, I'm reading through the Old Testament. Oh, Nick, you're in for a real treat. Yeah, I'm in De Deuteronomy right now. You're in for a real um, treat. What, and listen, I'm happy to read whatever segment you tell me and call back and discuss it further. Um, but I've had this, I've had this experience more than once um, where I read something initially in the old Testament. I think I understand it because of my surface level level reading of it. And then I begin to read commentaries and listen to sermons on it that kind of um, go into more detail about the context and exactly what's happening. And um, I'm not one of those people who thinks you can just interpret things any way you want. But when I come, my impulse is always when I come across a piece of scripture that seems particularly electrifying or wrong, my initial impulse now is to say, you know what, before I go down the path of immediately thinking this is what I, before I go down the path of thinking that I'm right about my conclusions, let me study this further. Well, okay, so fair, fair enough. But if you if that's it, in the Old Testament, I'm happy to read it. If you haven't read the Old Testament yet, I, I mean, I have. Okay, but I've studied it. But, you're you're way behind me. I mean, you got a okay. you got you got your work ahead of you. But when you okay. make claims like objective morality is discovered, I mean, it is real, not and you discover them. I mean, you got problems in your worldview of saying stuff like, well, then uh, stoning the practicing homosexual. If there's a truth of the matter, it's either moral or immoral, right? It's not dependent on subjective circumstances. There's a truth of the matter that's grounded in God. Well, if, uh, if that's right, your position, yeah, you're in deep doo doo. <laughs> no, but but surgeons use 
chemotherapy and they use scalpels in very specific contexts. They don't advocate for taking your scalpel and running around the streets cutting people. And my, my point is, because something appears in a context, it can be the objective truth. Not that, in other words, when we read something in the Bible, I think oh. it's important to recognize that we don't say... You know what you're doing now? Oh, you're taking objective, here. what you view as objective morality, and you're meshing no, no, no. it with subjective. This is what I'm, just just listen to the, the whole thought. It's it's important that you don't take an isolated incident and think because this is here, it therefore has universal application. The objective point that could be being made is that this is appropriate here, not this is appropriate everywhere. Taking a sword, taking a sword and piercing the heart of an infant, a baby, is that objectively wrong or right? Uh because God commanded that in the Old Testament. In, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read that passage as well. I'd want to know the context. I'd want to know what I'm, what I'm reading. Yeah, is and this, when you read that. Is this a way of, is this. Read Deuteronomy 15. Read okay. Numbers 31. Write this down. Uh, okay. Uh, or is it First Samuel uh, 15? Deuteronomy <clears throat> 15, maybe. Numbers 31, I know for sure. Um, Numbers 31. Yeah, and then and then while you read it, ask yourself this question: If objective morality, if there's a truth of the matter to moral actions between humans, then and then when you read about God commanding um, infants to be killed, animals to be killed, everybody to be killed, women to be killed, but spare the virgins, <laughs> you'll love that part in Numbers thirty-one. Um, what you're going to find is. Well, if I believe God is the basis, the, the ontology of objective morality, if you truly believe he's the ontology, then you have to say, stoning the practicing homosexual is good there, but it's not good today. And now well, you, you're, you're okay. left with non-objective morality. You're left with contextual morality, subjective morality, which you'll find maybe Doug is right and subjective morality is better. And and I'll I'll let this serve as my last uh, comment because I'm gonna. Oh, good timing! Because you just broke up. Am I still with you? Barely. But why don't we instead of you trying to say something? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for coming. Call back again. Okay. Just can I twenty seconds? Can I say something or no? You sure. Go ahead. We'll see if we can hear it. Okay. There's a there's an episode in the Old Testament. I can't remember the chapter where uh, people are killed. And it's not because God commands it. It's because I think Moses orders it outside of God. God doesn't command him to do it. He just commands the Israelites to do I it. I understand. That would, be an, that would be an episode where I would say the initial impulse when you read it could be, why would God allow this? Why would he want this? The answer is... That's not what I'm talking about. It. Okay, good. I just want to I'm talking sure about God commanding it. And this is okay. how this is how slippery apologists try to get make themselves sleep at night and say, "Well, God really didn't command this. This was Moses' own idea." Well, no, I mean, if it's exegetical, it's not slippery. It's just a clear reading of the text. But oh, I hear what a, you're saying. A clear reading of the text. Yeah, that's yeah, what. <laughs> if he doesn't, if he doesn't command it, then he's not the one. Then we can't. Say you can't it. avoid the flood. That's for sure. Is drowning babies objectively wrong? Well, well, sure. I mean, I, I understand. No, the in, in the flood story, but yes, anytime else. Okay, thank you, well, Nick. That's going to get in. P.F. Young, that was fun. I, uh, I can't hear you yet. Man, look at that chest hair bubbling through. I mean, sexy. I said fun's a strong word. <laughs> I had a nickel for every time someone said it's exegetical so it isn't slippery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you think of that conversation? Or did you um, not even listen to gonna, it? Can I ask you, first off, are you or have you ever been diagnosed as autistic? No, I'm not autistic, actually. Okay. I don't know if I am. I feel like I have I don't think you are. You don't think so? No. Because you were rattled when you were rattling off the specific verses. Do you run me 30? Do you run me 14? I was thinking like, oh. Well, it's just because I've done this for you. Train. Yeah, that's fair. I was going to say. Yeah, I I yeah. But if you were autistic, you wouldn't style your hair that way. I'll take that as a compliment. 
<laughs> now, if I'm autistic, I will have misread that as an insult. But um... for people who don't know, let me introduce you. This is P.F. Young, uh, a.k.a. Paul, an up and coming new YouTube creator who's going to go big time in the near future. And so here's your chance to have him notice you, because if you want to be semi famous, you want to know Paul from P.F. Young. Wow. Thank you, Doug. I'm th you can be famous adjacent by <laughs> by saying that. First off, up and coming. I'm closing in on your subscriber count here. Um, really? Yeah, I'm at 16.5, I think, or something like that. And you are 18.3, yeah, something like that. To be fair, I'm tapping into the intersection of politics and League of Legends, which is a very. I know you don't know anything about it, but it's a very fruitful. Uh, about politics or about? I don't know anything about League of Legends. <laughs> Uh, the the intersection of politics and League of oh, Legends okay. is very fruitful, um, a fruitful one. Because no one, no one does politics like me. True. Nobody loves politics. Well, nobody loves politics more than I do. <laughs> um, okay. I, the reason I come up, by the way, you're over here for me. My League of Legends match is over here. I had to I had to start up a League of Legends game because I came in. Maybe you're when you were saying maybe. I'm definitely artistic. Um. I came in when you were telling that guy, like, all right, we'll wrap it up here. And I was like, oh, let me hop in real quick. And then just four hours of apologetics later. <laughs> um, do you, let me, well, first let me ask you this. Do you, do you, I guess, do you find great meaning in just arguing for arguing's sake? I used to, not so much anymore. Like, not actually, much. Theus Thursdays is a bit of a chore for me. Because really? the conversation I just had with this guy, I've had literally hundreds of times. I was going to say, that's, that's where I, and I've heard... And obviously the specifics vary each time but i've heard i mean essentially it goes back to well how do you ground your morality how do you ground your it's like it's the same yeah thing we're dealing and the with. thing is the, the the challenge is like he hasn't even read the old testament he's a, he's he's 35 but i view him as very young he's years behind and i know what he's going to say before he says it and so and you just got to shut up bite your lip and and then let him get through his thing so then you can yep. say the counter to what he did and that's just like i could be him and have the same con conversation yeah um that's fair uh, that, is that why you started the politics channel exactly well big reason why because at least Paul see and they're not even separate the reason why a lot of atheists don't even like christians is because of the way they vote right policies and yeah. all that which is yeah. politics so who cares if you believe a man rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, most atheists say, unless it affects how you behave negatively to other people, is what they would say, mm -hmm. and which is politics. Right. The smart atheists would say that. The non-woke atheists. Seems like there's a bit of a mind virus spreading through your community. <laughs> Careful now. Don't go Peter Bogosian on me. No, I'm Peter kidding. I love Peter Bogosian. I was going to say, you're probably a huge fan of Peter Bogosian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he mentioned me on his latest video where... He, He's talking to some Taiwanese lady and he said, my friend Pine Creek said this and it really has shook me. My friend. <laughs> Are you going to do more uh, Pine Creek IRL? What was that for? Was that for, was Reed, did Reed yeah. set that up? Yeah, Reed set that up. If Reed, <sighs> the thing is, I don't like leaving the house. Mm, That's a problem. I'm late. But I have my, my League of Legends game up here. I can do yeah. that. Like, I like walking the dog, <clears throat> talking to the neighbors, but uh, it takes a real effort for me to go places. And Reed travels all over the world. He loves it. But if Reed convinces me, and I respect Reed, to do more in real life stuff, <coughs> I think I'm good at it. You I actually, are. You yeah. have camera presence. You're a little shorter in real life than you appear on camera. Yeah, I'm 5'10". So, but I can get lifts. Do you think I should get lifts? Well, I'm five ten, but this adds about two inches right here. Yeah. And then I and then I throw on some Nike Air ones, and that adds some. Uh, no, don't get lifts. You'll get you'll get the DeSantis treatment, which you don't want. Okay. You saw that right when he wore the um, the Tom Cruise shoes, the boots. Uh, he was on Bill Maher, and he had like it looked like he had high heels. Oh. Anyway, um, the reason I've come, Doug, is to uh, seek your wisdom, which I don't normally do. Paul, um, Paul, you've come to the right place. Yes, we shall see. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know this. There's this Canadian YouTuber by the name of J.J. McCullough. Oh, and, the hippie boy. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, he's one of my orbiters. Um, and he, we're, we're having a, we're doing a stream tonight on whether or not Candace Owens is anti-Semitic. Oh, you come here in the veil of asking for wisdom when really you're marketing. 
<laughs> no, I'm asking for I'm asking for I'm asking your opinion so I don't uh, get clipped and then you know get uh, what do you call it sent to. Okay, what do you need advice on? Is Candace Owens anti-Semitic? Are you familiar with the whole crisis yeah, 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 controversy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is Candace Owen anti-Semitic? An anti. Well, as you know, Paul, no one loves the Jews like I do. No one loves Jews more than so I. So, in that sense, she is. But uh, let me take your question. <laughs> <laughs> let let yeah. me take your question seriously. Yeah, for once. I know she has a Catholic husband. Yes, she does. Uh, They're big fans of Jews, I believe. The Catholics. Last I checked. And I know she's a Christian, and I know that she probably, although I haven't heard her talk about this, she probably is starting to buy into the end times garbage. You think so, really? That's my guess. If she's a Christian, a Catholic, yeah. Mm, the eschatological archetypal draw is significant nowadays. I would be lying to say otherwise. But that could work against, well, so I, if, she, if I'm right about that, then I would yeah. say, no, she's not anti-Semitic. Because do you think the, are the end of times people, they're generally pretty pro-Israel, right? Those are like the, the hardcore evangelicals. Yeah, yeah. So, so she's that, not that, so. So I'm saying that if she believes in the end times, she, they would make, make her more likely to support Israel because it will help the end times come sooner. Yeah, she doesn't believe that. Okay, not, if she doesn't believe that, doing. I, then I think she is slightly anti-Semitic because when you say Christ is Lord to Christ a Jew... King. Sorry, Christ is King to a Jew, an yeah. Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically saying you're worshiping a false god. You're 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 saying Christ is the real God, and the God of Orthodox Judaism isn't, because the God of Orthodox Judaism is not a Trinity and is not Christ. He's not a man to be hung on a cross. Sure, sure. So. Anytime that's highly say, offensive to a Jew. That's highly offensive. So being highly offensive makes one anti-Semitic? To a Jew, when you know that, like, um, if you're saying it, like, I, I listened to the uh, head of the Daily Wire, the guy who actually own, uh, runs it. Benjamin Netanyahu? <laughs> but, uh, oh, uh, Jeremy Boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's his name? Jeremy what? Jeremy, I think it's boring or boring. B o r like the boor, I don't know. This Jeremy guy. Yeah, Jeremy. I, I listened to his spiel about Candace Owen, and I actually agreed with it. Like, just Jews don't care if Christians say Christ is King and and they go on their merry way. But if you're using it as sort of like a weapon to a Orthodox Jew, yeah, to say you're wrong about this situation. The Jews are not, you know, the Jews, sure, were the chosen people, but now it's the whole community of Christ or whatever, neither Greek nor Gentile, uh, Jew or Gentile. So, um, yeah, it can, it's highly offensive for a Jew to hear that. Yeah, and, you know, the argument, like, if a bunch of, listen, if a bunch of, uh, as I like to call them, autistic Zoomer Nazis showed up at a synagogue on Christmas and, like, aggressively sang Christmas carols, you know, it's it's context, right? Yes, yeah. that's clearly. Um, so you're debating this hippie JJ. Yeah, he, JJ Cola, and uh, he's taking the position that she is or isn't. I, yeah, he he believes that she is uh, relatively, but she's 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 flirting with the anti-Semitic. And you're saying she isn't. Um, I don't think. Well, it, it's not so much. I don't know what's in her head. Um, what I would say is, I think it's important that people who are not anti-Semitic. Such as you and I, because nobody loves Jews more than I than we. Yeah, do. you're second place. I'm first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that normal people, uh, members of what I would call the non-freak right, right, the freak right, are the people who don't distinguish between Jews as a race and Jews as a religion, right? Because if you have problems with people because of their race, then you're socially and mentally handicapped. But if you have problems with they call that religion, racist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you have people's pr problem with people's religion, that's perfectly fine. I think it's perfectly reasonable and I would say morally decent if you have to have problems with Judaism or Christianity or Islam. So I think it's important for, yeah, the normies, the true normies to not see to the, to not, excuse me, I have a slight lisp, to not cede the linguistic territory to a bunch of autistic Zoomer Nazis. That's what I don't think is a good idea. I do not think the only people say, 
the only pe- I do not think it would be a good thing if the only people saying Christ is king are a bunch of autistic Zoomer Nazis, right? Because then the, the the average person sees that and goes, "Well, that doesn't sound anti-Semitic." Like I'm I'm Christian and da 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 whatever. And I guess the question is, like, why are you even debating this? What does it matter what Candace Owen thinks? Mm. That's a great question, Doug. Always asking the good questions. So you, you, so you're a systems thinker, Doug. You see the bigger picture. Right? Yeah, that's very that's good. That's what I do. Yeah, very good. Very I try to help the humans. The reason it's important, the humans. <laughs> you are autistic. The reason it's important. <laughs> the reason it's important is because um, this Christ is King meme represents a political, a significant political division on the right, and. It's it, it, there's 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 a new fa- it's a new there's two new factions so to speak. The America First crowd and the Israel First crowd is what I like to call it. I I'm I'm not very pro Zionist. I'll I'll admit that up front. Um, I I believe that Benjamin Netanyahu is at significant odds with U.S. interests and just generally a villainous figure. Um, so this divide between like the Christian like the Candace Owens Christian right and the Daily Wire sort of mainstream right, like the Christian Zionist right. That's a new political divide, sort of like Trump versus the establishment Republican Party. Huh. I didn't know this. What do you I, think of that? I, I'm well, not... this is my theory. I, I'm okay, not okay. suggesting it's <clears throat> fact. but I Well, mean, it's definitely a divide amongst uh, probably Daily Wire viewers, but I really don't care about that. And I don't even know if the Daily Wire viewers care about that. I think there's going to sure. be people who side with um, the short guy with the cap. What's his name? Benjamin. No. Uh, the Daily Wire guy. Am I, am I, am I, am I, oh, oh, yeah, Ben. Yeah, you're right. Ben Benjamin. I, I don't know him as Benjamin, only Ben. Ben Shapiro. Benjamin. I just came in last in my League of Legends game. Just like, if I had to choose who I like more, Ben or uh, what's the woman? Or Candace? Yeah. I, I like Ben better. Ben's way smarter. He's way more religious. Well, he, ta- he talks He's faster too, religious. and I, I love fast talkers. That's fair. Um, now, guess- Candace is black, and I do like black women. True, nobody loves black people more than I do. Um, <laughs> I guess. I the, I mean, it, it comes down to I don't know if you saw. You're familiar with Destiny, of course. I know you. I know you've told me offline you idolize him, and you wish you could talk to him but he doesn't call me anymore i know he 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 doesn't like the elderly um he even today pointed out how the idf you saw the idf strike on the the aid workers yeah i mean this shit's getting rapidly worse and worse for well, but there was and apparently were... one bad person they killed too right so i guess it's worth it right um that was the Hamas. Well, it depends logic on the aid workers. They, like, that was the Hamas logic on October seventh. Well, we killed civilians, but we did get some IDF military targets as well. It's like, mm-hmm. like some aid aid workers deserve it. I mean, let's be real honest. Well, we all <laughs> we all fall short of the glory of God. But my point is, I there's a there's a w- w- in, this is more of a I have opinions on this prescriptively, but I would say just looking at it descriptively, it seems like the the the, the big divide now. Like Trump and the establishment, the right had, had a big divide. The new divide, the future divide, over the next few years is going to be the pro-Zionist right versus the anti-Zionist right, the America First crowd versus the Israel. First. That's not a good way to do it because no one who's who's anti-Zionist yeah, no one would frame would, it that way. Yeah, no one would call themselves <clears throat> Israel First. I call it that way because I believe Ben Shapiro cares more about Israel than the United States. I believe. Well, tell me what you think of this. If you are a religious Jew. And you believe that Israel is the Holy Land, that it was granted to you by God, it is divine, more so than the United States. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be the correct religious thing to do to care more about Israel than the United States? Yes. It's kind of like, you know, if you walk into a church and they care more about America than they care about God, I think everyone would go like, ooh, that's kind of a weird thing. That's like a... Yeah. And so with Judaism the strain of Judaism that believes that Israel is a divine holy state granted to the God's chosen people by God. Well, of course they would care more about Israel's interest in the United States. I don't see how that's controversial, but then I get accused. Yeah. Of- like I'm, I'm an America first type right winger. So I, I'm, 
totally okay with no money going to Israel, no money going to Ukraine. Why are we fighting these wars for other people? What's how does it benefit the United States or hurt the United States? Like if you can give me an argument, okay, then maybe we should intervene. But for the most times, the United States seems like they do more harm than good around the world. So let's just worry about our own house. Um, yes, that's the America first right, and I think yeah. Candace Owens and Tucker Carlson falls into that category. Yeah, and so, but I I still like Ben better, Ben Shapiro better. Well, that's but that fair enough. You like him as a person. Ben. Yeah, but, I like and and, and even as a debater, line more. But I bet you if Ben were to come in the show and I said, do you think uh, Israel actually needs our money? I mean, you Jews are rich. <laughs> yeah, then you'd, be, then you'd be done. Then. <laughs> but they are. Then we... They got money. They got their uh, a tremendous military, air force. Yeah, but I do not think... It, they got nukes. Not... Yeah, I don't think Ben would say... Yeah, and therefore we don't need to provide aid to Israel. I think Ben is quite clear that the united states well then i would i would say to ben you're only israel. saying that because you're a jew well that's the, and this is the important thing this is what the freak right doesn't do or the freak left for that matter the freak left are the ones who are pro hamas and the blm chicago folks who posted the paraglider meme did you see that mm, yeah i think yeah i saw it the blm the blm chicago chapter posted when the like the day of or the day after october 7th that's the freak left the freak right are the ones who say Jewish people by ethnicity and by a race are bad, which is the most absurd fucking thing in the world. But Jews, religious Jews who believe the state of Israel is divine. Yeah, that's that is at odds with American interests, I would say, by definition. No. <laughs> I disagree with that. OK, why? Not by definition. Why? Uh, well, let me say, like, maybe not at odds, but certainly they they that. that that I I would describe that as Israel first over America first. Okay, um, that's different. Yeah, that's a better way of saying that because I don't think it's necessarily because obviously, you know, Israel and the United States has a close relationship and it's not necessarily always but at odds. I, I think a lot of Americans almost view Israel as their um, stepchild, proxy state. Yeah, it's yeah exactly. Yeah, Biden said if there were no Israel, we would need to create an Israel just to. Secure. American I actually like your elite. idea. Bring, Bring them all back here. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Listen, look, I mean it. Nobody loves Jews more than I do. Okay. <laughs> Bring the Jews home. Okay. America, listen, I don't believe in all this divine country nonsense except America. Okay. G whatever God you believe in, he chose America as his chosen country. You know what we could so, do? Like in Nevada, there's, uh, was it Mead Lake, Powell, Lake Powell, whatever. There's, we can do a man made lake like the, um, uh, the Dead Sea, and then we could do like the Jordan River in Nevada, and we could like uh, send out one of our bombers in to uh, get all the Jews in Israel to go to sleep, a deep sleep, not kill them, but just a deep sleep, and then we secretly transport them here and and get and duplicate <laughs> just all their homes, it? just recreate it, and when they wake up, they're like, oh, that and was then build weird. it, and build a giant dome, like uh, yeah, the, the dome Vegas one with the. And, and tell them like, don't, the don't leave, show? don't leave here yeah. because because it's not safe. I mean, and so they just think they're in Israel, but really they're not. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like the right move. I mean, I, listen, I'm all for it. I'm for bring the bring, especially the secular Jews, bring them here. The Orthodox Jews who say, and it's of course not all of them. There's many Orthodox Jews who don't even believe that Israel should exist. They believe it's an apostasy. So even saying Orthodox Jews is too much of a generalization. But there are Orthodox Jews. The hardcore ones who say death to Arabs and my rights as a Jew matter more than your rights as an Arab because we are God's chosen people. That's what I don't like. And I think I think the the split that Candace Owens catalyzed or is in the midst of catalyzing is I think we're having a moment with Judaism. It's a similar moment with Judaism that we had with Islam a few years ago. You, I think I mentioned this to you before, but you know the Ben Affleck, Sam Harris yeah, yeah. famous clip on Bill Maher? Yeah. Ben Affleck's like, well, they just want to make some sandwiches. And it's like Bill Maher's <laughs> here. It's like, yo, we're, I'm, it, look, of course, plenty of uh, perfectly reasonable Muslims. We should be clear about the facts about the extremist Muslims because they do exist. Yeah. I think we're having a similar moment with Judaism. Where it's like, uh, of course, overwhelming. First off, separate Jews as a race from Jews as a religion. That's number one. That's the base, the bare basics. But and then there's plenty of Jews who do not believe that, you know, Gaza should be... Uh, 
annexed to the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, they call it. But then there is a there is a non-trivial circle of uh, religious Jews who believe Judea and Samaria are theirs by divine right. Their rights literally matter more than the Arabs because they're God's chosen people. And that's problematic to me. And I feel like I feel like yeah, it whenever not you be controversial you, to say that. Yeah, whenever you use God to justify uh, taking real estate, yeah, that's always a problem. And Yahweh seems like he's in the real estate business in the Old Testament, so but I think I think the solution is for to convert Jews to atheism, which I think is doable, and then convert uh Gazans and West Bankans to Mennonites. <laughs> Pacifistic Mennonites. That would work. I think that would work. I think that's a good solution. We should fund some uh, missionary trips. You should do Pine Creek IRL, Gaza edition. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that? <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. Hey, I brought some uh, queers from uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, bring your... <laughs> what do you want to do with them? <laughs> bring the Queers for Palestine uh, detachment with you. I'm sure they oh, will. Oh my goodness, there's some stupid people it. in this country. Okay, so look, I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, because, because really the. You're, because you asked, like, what's the fundamental issue? Why, why do I care about Candace Owens and all that? It's like, uh, she's, a t she's a mimetic canary in the coal mine, but she's, she's an embodiment of a broader conversation that's going on. And I think the deepest conversation is a religious one, and it's about just... But I really got to know this... Extreme Judaism is a problem. I really got to know this from you, though, Paul. Yeah. What time is the debate tonight? I refuse to plug my stuff on your own And show. where can people find you? I refuse to plug my. You accuse me. You accuse my motive. I came here. I sat through that. Whatever. It's P. F. Young on YouTube, just as you see it here. Oh, hang I sat, on. I sat through that apologetics nonsense for two hours. Okay. I, I know. That's why hours. I'm. Uh, that's why I'm allowing this marketing. I know. See, that's his name, everyone. All you have to do is type it, and then you'll see this really hippie. He's a good-looking guy, but a really hippie-looking Canadian guy. Uh, not to say you don't look good, Paul, but. Um, yeah, so it'll, my guess is it'll be entertaining. And my guess is it's going to start in uh, two hours from now or something. You know, who knows? Am I right? It starts at 7 p.m. Central. Yeah. 7 p.m. Central. So if you live on the West Coast, let me even do the math for you. That's six your time. <laughs> no, that's five their time. Five? Central yeah. is two hours? Central is two hours. Oh, that's right. I'm thinking mountain. Eastern, Central, Mountain. Yeah, Arizona doesn't change. So Okay. I am regretting asking you for advice on anything. You don't even know the... So it's if nice if he if you don't get a hundred or two hundred viewers like I got one hundred ninety four here and we're not even talking about anything important so um, yeah uh, go watch well look and... I I have I have I don't know listen nobody loves Pine Creek Doug's audience more than I do okay <laughs> um, but you are you 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 carve out a unique niche of the conservative atheist um, and I think that's uh it's like um it's like the duck billed platypus. You know, you're like a duck bill. The conservative atheist is like the duck bill platypus because it's technically an evolutionary miracle. Yeah, yeah. It's like that doesn't make any sense because all the conservatives I know are. Oh, you know what? Quoting the Bible <clears throat> and all that. Recently, I've been on Discord talking to what I call woke, mostly woke left progressives. Yeah. And I'm having a blast. Which well, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but which servers are you? Uh, politics and religious religion oh, yeah. server and. And I mean, there's like 40 of them and one of me. And, <laughs> and I, I, I honestly like half my brain. Fight my, for them. Yeah, it, it, it's so and I, I'm so honest with them. Like I'm manipulating you here. Walk into my <laughs> traps. I'm calm. <laughs> it's it's just so much fun. Do you know who Darth Dawkins is? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've talked to him a few times. I've I I think I'm I think I'm like you in many ways, unfortunately. Um, and I have a propensity to argue, or I, I just I need a, I need I need I need a, a, an anvil to hammer out ideas with, right? And w before I started the channel, I would during COVID, I would go into the politics Discord, and I'd have arguments and stuff. Um, and Darth Dawkins <laughs> is a well, he do, he won't let you ask him questions. questions. He's like, yeah, I know, he's like. I don't know. He, did you see the interview I did with him? No. Oh, you gotta watch that. What's it's it like called? All time Pine Creek Doug Classic. Oh, it was so much fun. Uh, Darth Dawkins, Pine Creek, Jesus, maybe. Yeah. So type in Darth Dawkins Pine Creek Jesus. Oh, I can just give you the link here too. 
Throw it back in. Actually, uh, Tom Rabbit's version is better than mine. Oh, okay. I'll, <laughs> so yes, go to Tom Rabbit's channel to watch it because he he added captions. And uh, here it okay. is in the chat. Um, did you see the Coleman Hughes thing on the View? Yeah, I made a short on it. It's you did. Tre tremendous. Yeah, I'm way ahead of you. You got to if you want to be a creator, you got to beat know. me on these things. Y you're because you, I'm just an old fart. You get lost in the the, the tyranny of the proposition. You know John Bravaki by any chance? Yeah, I know him. What do you think of John Bravaki? I hate him. Yeah. <laughs> you hate the Neoplatonists, yeah. I hate pantheists. I hate I hate he's verbal not, he's diarrhea. Not a oh my! God. I know he's not, but I have hate verbal diarrhea. Have you ever, listen, one man's verbal diarrhea is another man's ambrosia. Okay. He's and he's too tall. He makes me feel insecure. John Verveke? Yeah. How tall is he? I think yeah. I don't know. He's tall. I think he's particular. Are we talking about the t same person, the white hair John, guy? That doesn't narrow it down. John Verveke <laughs> is. It's V E R V A. E K E. I don't think we're talking about the same person. He's on Lex Friedman. No, we're talking about two different people. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, John Verveke. This is, all, and I'll end with this because you took up so much of my time with that apologetics nonsense that I sat through. Um, and I have a Destiny Jordan Peterson debate reaction to get. I know I'm late on the game, but it is an intersection that I must pursue. John Verveke talks about the tyranny of the proposition. Right? There's many ways of knowing something, Doug. There's your world, facts and logic, what I call nerd shit. Okay. So Socratic dialogue is good. It's useful. Okay? Facts and logic is nerd shit? Facts and logic is nerd <laughs> shit. Right. Then there's what's called uh, participatory knowing. This is the knowing of... Um, well, actually, there's procedural knowing. How to play... You, you play any instruments? Yeah, you saxophone. Musically inclined. Yeah. You can't, you can't put into facts and logic. And I logic. also play progressive woke people. Well said. I'm See, that's good comedy. That's not facts and logic. That's something new or something different, rather, not new. <laughs> um, but exactly that point is comedy, Doug, is a form of knowing that exists outside the realm of facts and logic. My dog disagrees with you. Your dog is a, a bitch if she's a female. Comedy. Um and what I think you do is you submit to the tyranny of the propositional. You, actually, that's not true. You're pretty funny. I'm funny looking. Um, but the I think the most effective way to communicate information is through participatory knowing, through comedy, by acting out truth in a sophisticated way. Which I'm not. Yeah, I think I think humor and comedy is the best way to change people's minds. Yeah, not nerd shit facts and logic. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. It's it's meeting people where they're at. Um, but once in a while, you have to throw in facts and logic and all that. That's subject. true. I I I shit on it more than I probably should. I've probably set myself up. For but this is why I have had such great success with woke people. Like I've seriously have shifted a lot of people to the right. And I seriously have shifted a lot of Christians to, let's say, agnosticism or atheism. Um, it's because, number one, I, I have the attitude, like, I don't really don't care. Like, stay a Christian, stay a woke person, vote for Biden, love God. But here's why I don't. And let me ask you some questions. But yeah, so many times, just... like, people are just so, whoa, they got that stick up their butt. And... Yeah, ideologically possessed, as our good yeah. friend Jordan B. Peterson would put it. Well, I'm looking forward to watching. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I, you co-sign everything I say. Um, sure. And, yeah. And uh, it, if it, if it, I almost said when, if your YouTube channel fails, <laughs> yeah, and and you're, you're hungry, I I will feed you a couple meals. I can. Could I? In, I could intern. I could be a Pine Creek Doug intern. Yeah. Why don't you come to Tucson? I'll t I and hey, I don't say this to anybody. I say yeah. most people stay away from me, but I will. Take you to Outback Steakhouse. The the, the jewel of Tucson. <laughs> Outback Steakhouse. Okay, That's just for that, I'll take it to Dove Mountain. All right. Yeah, that's, mm. That sounds good. Dove Mountain sounds like it could be expensive. Okay, okay go go do your work. All right, I will. Be a good capitalist. Godspeed. See All ya. right, Christ is king. <laughs> Don't let the autistic Zoomer Nazis be the only one who says that, okay? <laughs> Get out of here. All right. Peace. Oh, how long have I been going?
three hours, and I got two people one in. And Corey's been waiting a long time. And Jay, Jim, Jim Bob, I know you're listening, but I seriously got to pee, and I've been going for three hours. Uh, but I'm going to talk to Corey for a short time, as long as I can hold my urine. Hi, Doug. It's me again. Well, have we talked? Yeah, I was the guy grunting. Uh, oh, you're the guy who grunts. And yeah. uh, let me see what else I remember. You're schizophrenic clinically. Uh, <laughs> oh, you didn't want me to say that? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. No, it's all out there in the open. Yeah, I, yeah, I have nothing against mentally ill people. I, I treat everybody as adults. Um, okay. What did you want to say? Well, I just wanted to say, uh, like, I think, uh, well, I, I want to say, like, I think if you're a Calvinist and you're planning on having children, you're kind of a schmuck. Amen, because, Corey. <laughs> yeah, because you're basically consigning them to a certain doom in, in most cases, right? So, um, but so why stop at Calvinism? Injury. I mean, if you're well, any, any type of Christian, you shouldn't reproduce, right? Well, no, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I personally adhere to that because I think that, that that command, quote unquote, at the beginning of the Bible to uh, be fruitful and multiply is like, that's, okay, fill the earth and preserve the nature, uh, uh, the, uh, the nation of Israel. But beyond that, once the Messiah has come, I mean, you don't see Can anything. Can you hold your camera the camera still? Yes, yeah, sir. If you don't, you don't see anything in the New Testament of, of being fruitful, and multiplying. In fact, Paul acts like marriage is a compromise to uh, to celibacy, and yeah, and then point. Jesus, and then Jesus has a line. He says, uh, uh, "Woe to those who who are with child and give suck in those days." And you know, and I think we're headed towards the end, uh, of like a lot of Christians. But I actually uh, think Trump is the Antichrist myself, so I don't see why. <laughs> oh why you'd want to vote for him? Yeah. But well, that's this okay. Channel called. I I kind of I kind of like the Antichrist, so. Oh well. Okay. <laughs> well, let's not go there. Because you know my, who my boss but, is, right, Corey? Yeah, it's, I know. Sitting in the corner, and it's yeah, Lucifer. It's, it's, it's all your guys' bosses. I mean, yeah, but. Um, but you know, I, I, Corey, Corey, I got to pee. Did you hear that earlier? I really got to pee, and I wanted to let you in here for a minute or two. And I think that's already happened. But you make come a on, no, I just want, I just want to make a, a point about. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my constellation of beliefs some other time, which I think are like free of any any error or or, or discrepancy or whatever. And any ten ten tension uh, tensions are gone. If you adopt my theology, but I won't get into that. But what I want to say is, uh, there was this Puritan uh, family, the Barbans, and they named their son Samuel. If Christ had not died, when a man for the tells you he has to pee, and you start death. talking about Puritans, I mean, that's disrespectful. Oh. Uh, well, can I tell your audience? <laughs> no. Well, why? What do you think I'm going to tell them? I just, I just want to say the Puritans are out of their mind. They named their son. Thou hadst been damned if Christ had not died for thee. I mean, that they put that in his name. It's like, a, it's like a woman's the... about to give birth. And before you go into the, the room there with the doctor, <laughs> let me tell you about the Puritans. <laughs> Nobody yeah, cares about well, the Puritans. Okay. But people can but, relate uh, to uh, to wedding themselves. So, uh. <laughs> uh, hang on here. Let me... I gotta at least do an outro, right? What are we gonna play? I think we have to play my one of my favorites. Oh, this is Theus Thursday. We gotta keep.